The esteemed Dr. Thomas Morstead entered the cell of the anomaly. He'd been warned and even chastised by his colleagues. But who in the Foundation could tell him what to do? He was the best at what he did, maybe the greatest in the whole history of the Foundation. As he entered the room, SCP-049 bid him welcome, cordial as always. So polite, in fact, that you'd never guess you were talking to a killer. Dr. Morstead knew the truth of what he was dealing with, but he also believed he could get through to 049. Calm him, exercise the devil from him. It was the meeting of two great minds, one of them human, one of them part human, part something that has never been clear. It was to be a battle of wits, and like so many great battles, this one would turn into a massacre. Before we get to that fateful meeting, there are some things you should know about the anomaly known as SCP-049. If you saw him in the street, the first thing you'd think of is playing, because 049 always looked the same, a man dressed in black robes with a plague doctor's mask. But this wasn't a costume that could be taken off. In fact, it wasn't a costume at all. It was him. The robes had grown out of him like an exoskeleton. That horrible mask with the pointed nose wasn't covering his face. It was his face. A kind of shell that had seemingly sprouted from bone. The first reports came during World War II. In a picturesque town in the south of France called Montauban, people had begun going missing. Children disappeared from their beds in the middle of the night and weren't seen again. Adults went to the market and never returned. Local authorities searched high and low. They scoured nearby woods and dragged the rivers, but nothing was found. Because what was happening wasn't criminal, there was no clue they could stumble upon or eyewitness who would break the case. No, this was something else. Something that the townsfolk could never understand. Word spread, and that's when a search and discovery team was sent from the Foundation. It was a cold, dark night in January of 1941 when the team found what they were looking for. They walked through the open door of a small house located not too far from the Grand Chateau de Richelieu to find a masked man sitting next to an open fire. And he wasn't alone. The floor around him looked like it was moving. Upon closer inspection, the team saw that the floor was covered with writhing, grasping bodies. It's patience, as it called them. Bienvenue chez moi, said the thing. Welcome to my home. Those so-called patients crawled towards the team, intent it seemed to cause harm. The hostiles, now known as SCP-049-2s, were deemed dangerous and had to be eliminated. A sight, it seemed, that didn't bother 049 in the slightest. It just sat there, occasionally looking up from writing notes in a leather-bound book as his patients were gunned down. Once the carnage ended, it simply closed its book, stood up, and allowed itself to be escorted away. And that's the story of how 049 ended up at the facility, becoming a guest of sorts, staying in a standard secure humanoid containment cell, Research Sector 02, Site 19. The few that came into contact with 049 remarked that it was a pleasure for them, with its impeccable manners, vast knowledge of medicine and human anatomy, sharp tongue, and stinging wit. They almost became spellbound listening to it, caught in the throes of its charms until, with the simple touch of its hand, it would drain the life from them. That's why SCP-049 was classified as a Euclid. That's why armed guards were always stationed outside its cell. It's why doctors took great precautions when in its presence, and it's why Dr. Morstead should have known better. Remember, when 049 was discovered in France, it willingly went with the team, like it was happy it had been found, as if it had planned its own capture. When it arrived at the facility, it didn't act like it was contained against its will. It was like it was returning home. Initial findings as to the biology of 049 were that it didn't require any sustenance at all, not even water. It seemed content to be left alone with its notebooks. It did not object when it was asked if it could share some of its notes and gladly handed over its journals. But upon examination, it was discovered that they were written in the language that no linguist or cryptologist has so far been able to translate. It's apparent that 049 derives much satisfaction from seeing so-called experts struggle over its text. Unable to read those notes, a long line of doctors visited 049 in its cell, each fascinated by what they beheld. It was learned that it has traveled the globe. It speaks many languages, but prefers to speak what it calls les langues de l'amour, French. It asked for only one thing, warm-blooded animals. The facility agreed to supply 049 with various kinds, including rabbits, cattle, and even an ape on one occasion. Just like with humans, it could kill the animals with a mere touch of its hand. 
sucking the life right out of them. But that wasn't even the most incredible part. Soon those animals would rise again, as if reanimated by 049. They would become, for all intents and purposes, the living dead. And they were hostile. After several unfortunate incidents, they were taken from the cell the moment they arose and disposed of in the incinerator. This was not to the liking of 049, who would claim it had cured the animals. For it, the world was sick. It saw plague and pestilence everywhere, and the meaning of its existence was to rid the world of disease. Humans, it said, contained a virus and had to be cleansed. In the first days after arriving at the facility, 049 didn't seem to pose a threat to humans. He was quite friendly, in fact. It seemed aware of the fear it caused in staff and would often go out of its way to make them feel comfortable and safe. This was a ruse, of course, or a canard, as 049 liked to say. It had no intention to help humans. Hmm. No, it had come for humans. It wasn't trapped. It had set a trap. One of the first people to truly upset 049 was Dr. Raymond Hamm, a well-respected physician that had twice been a contender for the Nobel Prize for his more mainstream work. What had confused Dr. Hamm the most was not 049's clothes like exoskeleton, or even his ability to reanimate the dead, but the bag that it used. 049 was somehow able to pull a seemingly endless supply of surgical tools from that bag. Sometimes it would even pull out objects that were somehow larger than the bag itself. It was as if the bag connected to somewhere else. And that's what Dr. Ham wanted to talk about on that fateful day. With 049 on one side of the cell and Dr. Ham on the other, he asked, how is it that you can produce a great quantity of tools from that bag? I've observed you, and it seems to me that you are doing the impossible. Dear doctor, replied 049, the scourge, the great dying, cannot be fought with a handful of toys. My bag is merely the product of my imagination. It gives me what I require. You, dear sir, it seems, are limited by your imagination. It stopped for a second or two and stared at Dr. Ham. I detect you are unwell, it said, in a voice not as amiable as before. It's just a cold, said the doctor. Ah, just a cold. If you had seen what I have seen, you would not utter such insulting words. Dr. Ham pulled out some papers from a briefcase and approached 049, holding them close enough so it could read them. You see, said Dr. Ham, pointing to the results on the paper. Those animals you say you cured, they were not diseased. They were perfectly healthy before they died. And your so-called cure, it turned them into something quite terrible. We found that if they were left alone, they began to eat each other, and then themselves. 049 did not respond, and after a brief pause said only, A good day to you, doctor. Please close the door on your way out. You should get some rest. Ham refused to go and instead turned the conversation to this real interest, the bag, demanding that 049 let him see inside of it. Very well, doctor, 049 said, in private. 049 began to pull a series of long metal poles out of its bag, followed by a rolled up curtain that it hung between them, creating a kind of medical tent around Dr. Ham. It seemed to stare for just a moment into the observation camera outside of itself before whipping the curtain shut. Dr. Ham was discovered three hours later, crawling around the floor of 049's cell, now another mindless undead. When he was retrieved by security, 049 didn't even look up from his notebook. Dr. Ham didn't get the incinerator treatment, but he did receive a fatal dose of drugs, a mercy. A removal team was sent to 049's cell, but it had said there was no need for special extraction techniques. It would go willingly, wherever they wanted to go. It was not, it said, an enemy of the people. The Hippocratic Oath forbids me to hurt a human being, it said while walking to the interrogation center. My only desire is to offer you my services and expertise. The floors and walls of the interrogation center room were painted a bright white. Even the table was white, which contrasted with 049, a mass of black sitting in the middle of the room. During the interrogation, it refused to admit or even accept that it had killed Dr. Ham. I cured him. I removed the pestilence from his body, it said. It was later asked if it regretted its actions, to which it replied, Well, good sir, one always regrets the loss of a colleague for any reason, but I stand by my actions. The pestilence must be abated before it is too late. Every two weeks from that point, 049 was given animals. The scientists at the facility observed it time and again, touching the animals, killing them, before producing a saw or a scalpel and opening them up. Organs would be carefully removed with perfect precision. It was astounding to even trained surgeons just how talented 049 was. 
I require a close relative of yours, said 049 one day to a young doctor, who expressed shock that it was asked for one of the doctor's family members. I mean a great ape, said 049, not your dear aunt. There were several instances of 049 displaying a crude sense of humor. Staff would almost forget that the thing that they were talking to wasn't human, almost. And it was Dr. Thomas Morstead that had supplied the great apes, orangutans in fact that had been rescued from the rainforests of Borneo, only to be taken to 049 South. Then one day something changed. 049 told Dr. Morstead that its work was done, that it accomplished what it had wanted to do, and could someone remove the cured animal from itself. I think you'd find that it's quite the work of art. A triumph, 049 said through the intercom. When the removal team entered the cell, they found the orangutan, or what was left of it. It was lying in the corner of the cell. The top of its skull had been removed, leaving its brain exposed. On its face was the expression of relaxation, and from its mouth it issued very soft squeaks, like that of an infant. 049 said, Tell Dr. Morstead that its rage mechanism no longer exists. I've removed the amygdala and made some changes to the hypothalamus and limbic system. It is cured and quite harmless. The next day, Dr. Morstead announced that he wanted to visit 049's cell himself after which he heard a chorus of disapproval from his colleagues, all telling him that 049 was now too dangerous. Dr. Ham was sick, replied Morstead, and 049 has assured us that he would never take another human life. He's never lied to us, and I'm going to take him at his word. It appeared that 049 had created the perfect specimen, so what was next? Dr. Morstead had to know. Everyone is sick, 049 told Dr. Morstead after the two had talked for a couple of minutes. The great pandemic has started. Fear not, doctor. I have a cure. No longer will you humans spread your disease. I'm afraid you are wrong, replied the doctor. This pandemic you speak of does not exist. We can happily live with our pathogens. We have done so for millennia. Dr. Morstead became angry that he couldn't get through to 049. I'm afraid you are suffering from paranoia. It is you who need to be cured. You have no idea, said 049, standing up. What are you doing? shouted Morstead. You promised you wouldn't hurt a human again. I'm not hurting you. I'm healing you, 049 said and leapt across the room in a flash. Placing a hand on the doctor's head, Morstead slumped to the ground. They were being watched in the observation room, and this had gone too far. He had to be moved to the containment cells, permanently. Mobile Task Force Epsilon 11 was right on the scene and burst through the door. Now imagination, 049 said to himself. Those humans have no imagination at all. He began walking towards the task force who opened fire on the anomaly, but the bullets bounced off its black coat and mask. SCP-049 calmly touched each of the members of the task force one by one, draining the life from them. The last one standing stopped firing and attempted to run, but again 049 leapt across the room, black cape billowing out behind him, and gently touched the man causing him to drop to the floor. 049 stepped over the bodies of the fallen team and walked out of the containment cell. The full details of what happened next are available only to the O5 Council, what are sometimes called the Overseers. The redacted report that is available reads, Standard Secure Humanoid Containment Cell, Research Sector 02, Site 19, Subject, SCP-049, Date of Breach, Redacted, Euclid Class SCP-049 Breach Cell and subsequently gained access to adjoining rooms and nearby buildings. Breach lasted approximately three days and five hours. Total casualties? Redacted. With redacted number of survivors requiring incineration therapy. Course of Action. Department of Science Alchemy Division suggested injecting anti-transmogrified disinfectant into Class D former prisoners who were transported to site and allowed them to come into contact with SCP-049. SCP failed to reanimate injected prisoners and cure them. SCP-049 acknowledged this failure and surrendered to Mobile Task Force Alpha-1. SCP-049 then requested to be contained. Present containment under responsibility of Redacted, Redacted. Present location of SCP-049, Redacted. End of report. SCP-682 must be destroyed as soon as possible. So begins the SCP Foundation file on the dreaded SCP-682 a highly intelligent reptilian monster that has, despite the Foundation's best efforts, proved impossible to kill. It may not be the most dangerous SCP out there, considering that some are capable of eliminating entire realities, but it's one of the most iconic, 
and you've probably heard tales of the monster that death forgot, and you know exactly why everyone is so afraid of the so-called hard-to-kill reptile. It's been subjected to some of the most deadly weapons and traps the Foundation could devise, and survived attacks from some of its deadliest fellow SCPs. But before we tell you about the Foundation's many failed assassination attempts against the so-called hard-to-kill reptile, we need a little more groundwork on what this creature even is. The first thing to know about SCP-682 is that this thing wants you and everything you know dead. Unlike some other creatures like SCP-096 and SCP-173, which are murderous but exhibit no real higher processing skills, SCP-682 possesses cunning, advanced reasoning, and even human-level logical intelligence. SCP-682 can engage you in conversation, but just talking to the creature calmly and cordially will sometimes cause it to enter its rage state, where it becomes even more dangerous and volatile. The beast is perpetually kept in a tank of powerful hydrochloric acid, melting its tissue to prevent it from reaching its full potential and going on a rampage. The creature's most terrifying asset, and the reason it's proven impossible to terminate thus far, is its incredible adaptability to any and all external stimuli. 682 is a reactive being, capable of not only surviving and regenerating from all attacks, but often incorporating those attacks into its own wide arsenal. In other words, if you're hoping to kill this thing, you better kill it on the first hit. Because if you don't, you better believe it's going to hit you back a hundred times harder. This brings us to the main event. Some of the SCP Foundation's most ambitious and frightening attempts to terminate SCP-682, or even understand how it could theoretically be terminated. There are quite literally too many unsuccessful attempts for us to list them all here, so think of this as a highlight reel of the Foundation's most prominent failures. 682 was first cross-tested with SCP-017, a humanoid shadow entity shown to be able to consume matter with its shadows and leave no traces behind. Tests on tissue samples from 682 showed that SCP-017 was able to consume said tissues with no adverse effects. However, when SCP-017 was placed into the containment chamber with the actual creature, 682 let out a horrific roar that was so loud it damaged nearby audio equipment. SCP-017 fled to the corner of the room, and 682, in its rage state, attempted to breach containment. Agents managed to suppress and remove the creature, but no meaningful damage was logged. Attempt failed. SCP-173, the killer statue, was later brought in, hoping that its thus far impeccable track record for killing would hold strong. The second that 173 was introduced into the testing area, 682 retreated to the far wall and began screeching intensely. It was intelligent enough to know what it was dealing with here. While the researchers and guards expected an instantaneous reaction, there was actually a stalemate for over six hours as 682 stared at 173 continuously. Eventually, the tie was broken when agents shot out 682's eyes with high-caliber sniper rifles, breaking the line of sight and causing 173 to attack. Though 682 sustained damage to several parts of its body, while its eyes regenerated, the creature was not killed. It then regenerated a number of eyes all over its body, covered in a clear armored carapace that made them resistant to bullets. The stalemate continued for an additional 12 hours, as 682 maintained perpetual eye contact. 173 was eventually removed from the containment unit, and the mission was aborted. Attempt failed. In their desperation, the SCP Foundation restored to bringing in another dangerous and seemingly unkillable monster to take on 682. SCP-096, also known as the Shy Guy. As astute SCP fans will already know, this being kills anything that sees its face, with no known exceptions, and when it enters its attack mode, it's thought to be quite literally unstoppable. Or at least, it was. While SCP-096 was able to destroy 85% of 682's original body mass during their 27-hour battle, it was left mentally broken, <laughs> wounded, and huddled in the corner. To this day, if ever confronted with SCP-682, the Shy Guy reacts in pure terror, turning away and clawing at its own face. Attempt failed. During a deadly containment breach, SCP-682 also went head-to-head -head organically with another iconic SCP Hall of Famer, SCP-106, also known as the Old Man. 
the old man and a shape-shifting psionic anomaly known as SCP-953 broke into 682's containment cell. The old man pulled both of his fellow anomalous combatants into his pocket dimension to continue the battle on his terms. However, despite losing 67% of his body mass during the ensuing pocket dimension showdown, 682 still prevailed, with the old man eventually fleeing back to his cell and 953 being collected and taken away by agents. Once again, SCP-682 continued to hold the title. But it wasn't just cross-testing experiments, intentional or otherwise. The SCP Foundation's quest to kill 682 led them to a number of more conventional murder methods, all with varying degrees of success. Due to SCP-682's highly adaptive abilities, some methods were discounted from the outset. For example, launching a powerful thermonuclear missile at the creature was soundly rejected by O5 Command, on the premise that if the creature wasn't destroyed and evolved to the point where it could shrug off nukes, humanity would be pretty much done for. Other ideas were abandoned just for being too ridiculous, such as one researcher's suggestion to fly the creature through the air and drop it from a considerable height, hoping to kill it with a high-altitude impact. I'm not sure we even need to tell you why that's a terrible idea, but during the experiments on SCP-682, the studies range from honest to incompetent to straight-up evil. One guest researcher fed two small, innocent children to the creature, just to see what would happen. He was then himself fed to the creature for his sadistic behavior, which was viewed as getting in the way of his professional conduct. After all, the Foundation is meant to be cold, not cruel. It was SCP-682 that had the monopoly on cruelty. Mimetic kill agents were a resounding failure. They attempted to dismember 682 with a powerful laser, only to have the creature develop reflective services that displaced the beam and caused catastrophic damage to the area around it. They attempted to kill the creature by sucking all the air out of its containment facility and create a vacuum, but it expelled a dangerous gaseous compound that reacted violently and exploded when air was once again introduced into the room. The Foundation used high-precision blades to slice SCP-682 into approximately 12,000 pieces, then separated these pieces. Unsurprisingly by this point, this attempt also failed. The 12,000 pieces reformed a short while later into the fully operational killing machine we all know and fear. In one particularly frightening display of intelligence and adaptability, the Foundation attempted to kill 682 with extreme heat, but it shielded itself by developing a second carpace composed of solid helium. When personnel entered the room following the failed attempt on the creature's life, it shattered its helium carapace into deadly shards that fired around the room and shredded all Foundation personnel in attendance. It had set a trap, and that trap had been wildly successful. The creature's ability to adapt to seemingly any offense is unparalleled, to the point where Foundation staff have no idea how to classify this creature, whether it's organic, inorganic, or even alive at all based on any definitions we could understand. At every turn, the creature just raised more questions. What is it? Is it possible to destroy it at all by any means? Who was even trying to kill who here? because it certainly seemed like SCP-682 had a masterful KD ratio by now. More extreme feats of cross-testing continued in the Foundation's growing desperation to eliminate this monster. SCP-162, which is a hypnotic ball of sharp objects, hooks, and high-tension fishing line, was introduced to 682's containment cell. The hooks latched onto the creature and tore huge portions off, including its entire lower jaw and one of its limbs. However, 682 was still able to breach containment, kill 11 people, and badly wound 86 others. It regenerated its severe injuries in no time. The beast was even taken to the domain of the Gate Guardian, one of the proposals for SCP-001. The Guardian had a flaming sword hotter than the sun, capable of destroying its targets on an atomic level. Naturally, SCP-682 survived and regenerated. Perhaps the most fascinating cross-test of all was between 682 and SCP-053, who manifests as a kind, innocent little girl, with the unfortunate condition of causing homicidal tendencies in all who come into contact with her for more than 10 minutes. The people with these tendencies would then attempt to harm the girl, but would immediately drop dead shortly after, leaving the girl intact. The researchers present anticipated two possible outcomes here. The optimistic outcome, in which 682 enters a rage state, attacks 053, and died for good. And the realistic outcome, in which 682 attacks 053, possibly experiencing some minor injury or nothing at all, and 053 had to be removed from the containment cell. But that didn't happen. 
What did occur was considerably more shocking than any kind of violence. When 053 entered 682's containment chamber, the monster became uncharacteristically docile. Researchers and staff were baffled and watched with amazement as 053 approached the terrifying, immortal, mass-murdering monster and began to play with it. 682 even allowed 053 to draw on its face with crayons. Researchers thought they must have been dreaming seeing this surreal display play out. 053 even appeared to have affection for this unkillable misanthrope. It was a single act in defiance of everything they thought they knew. When Foundation personnel entered the containment cell to separate the two, 682 went ballistic and killed multiple guards. 053 also wept, sad at being separated from her new friend. To this day, despite further testing, the Foundation has no idea how or why this happened. Like many details surrounding SCP-682, it's shrouded in deeply frustrating mystery. And so the tale of SCP-682 continues, in spite of the Foundation's best efforts. The monster continues to breach containment and slaughter with some regularity, taking out its seemingly limitless hatred for not only human beings, but anything that dares draw breath. Nobody knows where exactly the creature is from, what its true nature is, or why its ability to adapt and regenerate far exceeds any known organism on this planet. Perhaps one day, through enough research and cross-testing, we can someday answer these questions with scientific precision. But until then, we only have one answer. Hatred never dies. Working at the SCP Foundation might just be the most exciting job a person can ask for. And by exciting, we mean that if you work as an SCP field operative, researcher, or mobile task force member, you're much more likely to die a horrific death on the job than, say, a plumber. But at least you get the honor of proudly saying that you're the first line of defense between the normal world and the terrifying domain of the anomalous. Well, unless you're one of the IT guys. Then your work life is likely as tedious and uneventful as the computer tech guy working on the Geek Squad. But nothing is ever normal when it comes to the SCP Foundation, where even the person whose job is helping other staff members reset their email passwords may run into the supernatural. Welcome to the strange and frightening world of Pattern Screamers, and specifically, SCP-000. SCP-000 was first discovered completely on accident by technical researcher David Rosen, a man intrinsically connected to the pattern screamers lurking on the SCP Foundation computer database. Technical researcher Rosen is actually somewhat of a celebrity around the Foundation staff, due to the fact that he's so perfectly mediocre at what he does. His job as the glorified IT guy at the SCP Foundation was previously held by the more qualified researcher Patrick Gephardt, but Rosen was called in to replace him after Gephardt mysteriously disappeared while on the job. Since 2012, Rosen has been Site-19's user-level tech support wizard, but the best thing that can really be said about his job competency is that he's got a 100% attendance record. He seems to live out of his office, which is described as the filthiest at the whole foundation. Every inch of the floor is covered in old, broken computer parts, and the air is stale with dust and the twin odors of sweat and lithium grease. It's a place so inhospitable that the Foundation has seriously considered bottling the stench as a kind of chemical deterrent. While Technical Director Rosen isn't good at his job per se, he isn't technically bad enough at it to justify the time and resources it would take to replace him. But the worst part about Rosen isn't his performance, it's his truly rotten attitude. He's universally described by his colleagues as being rude, grumpy, and combative with patience that's far too short for someone working in tech support. And while Rosen does have a real fear that the ghost of Researcher Gephardt is stalking him, he was about to have his first actual brush with the supernatural. It all started when he began receiving automated repair tickets for SCP-000, a file that had no reason to exist. As any longtime follower of the SCP Foundation will know, the universal designation for the first cluster of SCPs to be discovered is SCP-001. There is no SCP-000. It simply doesn't exist. And when Rosen first found the file lurking on the database, he found that it was filled with worthless nonsense. The object class was recorded as null, 
the special containment procedures read, error, field, containment underscore procedures does not exist, and the mess of a description simply read, internal system error, field undefined. Please contact system administrator over and over again, becoming more mangled and nonsensical each time. Technical Director Rosen, who could never resist an opportunity to complain, decided to leave an angry administrator's note on the useless file. He claimed that this pile of junk data was sending out pointless repair tickets because of its broken syntax, clogging up the system and preventing him from doing actual work on meaningful files. He assumed that this was all down to the database not knowing how to react to having files logged with insufficient information, and he suppressed all future repair tickets from SCP-000 before declaring the matter over and done with. What the pig-headed technical director didn't realize was that he was suppressing a call for help from an entity trapped in the white space below the article itself. It was a being born into a pure white world of absolute nothingness, an entity with no name and no place, but it was somehow capable of thought. Its panicked inner monologue is readable in the hidden text which takes the form of a rambling stream of consciousness. The being first described coming to life in this empty world with no memories of where it was or even how it got there. It spent what could have been years exploring the empty wasteland, Occasionally, it would see horrific monsters pop up around it, but only for a split second. The entity continued to wander, and little by little, the existential dread mounted, as it realized that it may truly be stuck here in oblivion forever. The entity only had one word to go on, a word repeated by some of the monsters it encountered. Foundation. The entity had no idea what this foundation even was, but it grew to hate and fear it. Was this foundation the one that trapped it here? The entity had all the time in the world to speculate on it. Eventually, the entity found its voice. Like any sentient creature in trouble, it began to call for help, eventually screaming, just hoping someone would notice it. These pleas likely translated into the frequent IT repair tickets, a coded SOS, an attempt to show that everything was not as it appeared on the SCP-000 file. Perhaps the entity may have found help if researcher Gephardt was still working at the Foundation, but instead its cries fell on the ignorant ears of Technical Director Rosen. It may as well have been speaking to a brick wall. Rosen, who had all the investigative zeal of Paul Blart Malkop, made sure that these cries would never lead to the entity's freedom when he suppressed the repair tickets. He had trapped the entity in a private blank hell, forever hating a life it didn't choose and could never escape. A relentless, existential nightmare. This is the gist of your average pattern screamer. Pattern screamers are a perfect example of literally making something out of nothing. They are often a kind of floating consciousness, created from nothing, trapped in pockets of nothingness between the fabric of reality, driven mad by the purgatory-like nature of their existence. They're less living entities and more conceptual constructs, pure ideas, that just happen to be self-aware of their own existence in their private hellish voids. The SCP-00 file, a file for an anomaly that doesn't exist and thus had no reason to exist, is a perfect breeding ground for a pattern screamer. But sadly for the pattern screamer in question, Technical Director Rosen had no idea. This isn't the only time that Rosen had run into a pattern screamer without even knowing either. And just like the first case, he was with no help whatsoever. This one began with SCPS, an otherwise empty file containing only this image. Director Winters, a Foundation administrator, wondered why this file even existed. Enter Technical Director Rosen, filled with equal parts sarcasm and insubordination. He gave a condescending reply to Director Winters, saying that the file was there to test the filing system, and the image was likely just a placeholder. Winters never should have been on the page anyway, according to Rosen. Director Winters was annoyed at Rosen's typically rude tone, and asked him to make the purpose of the article clearer in the article itself. In response, Rosen did as he was told, filling the article in the most sarcastic manner possible. The whole thing was essentially a middle finger to Director Winters for having the audacity to even ask. Rosen signed off with, There. Finished. I certainly hope I have been clear enough to anyone who may have accidentally accessed this page, through what I am sure is no fault of their own, so we won't have any more incredibly competent directors bugging the tech team about this page. 
And once again, technical researcher Rosen was too busy being a rude, unpleasant jerk to notice he was practically staring another pattern screamer in the face. This pattern screamer, or rather, hive of pattern screamers, were trapped even deeper than the one in SCP-000. This one was hidden in the very source code of SCPS, where a chorus of enraged voices screamed the following. Pretend, monster, just for a minute. Pretend you were the size of an amoeba, dwarfed by even the smallest of bugs. Pretend you didn't hold the world in a glass cage. Pretend you were the one being held by something greater than yourself. Would you still be laughing at your triumphs? Would you still feel pride in what you were, even as pitifully small as you would be? Of course you would, because you are arrogant and stupid. If you haven't guessed yet, we hate you. This pattern screamer is clearly more aware of its pitiful station in existence than the 000 pattern screamer. And as a result, it's not so much depressed as it is furious. Though at this point, you've probably figured out that even the entities who have the most casual brushes with technical researcher Rosen end up getting infuriated. But while you may have gotten the impression that all pattern screamers are sad little entities worthy of our sympathy and pity, there's at least one pattern screamer that's actually incredibly dangerous. This is SCP-3930, the ultimate pattern screamer, in terms of both size and effect. It's an anomaly so strange it defies typical containment classification, and it bears a level 5 security lock, meaning only those on the level of the legendary O5 Council are cleared to even know about it. Its greatest containment procedure is the preservation of the very idea that SCP-3930 does not exist, because the alternative has terrifying implications for all involved. SCP-3930 is a 1km area in Russia that is filled with non-existence, to even call it a white void would be inaccurate, because it implies the existence of the color white and the existence of the concept of a void. Nothing exists within SCP-3930, and anyone who directly observes 3930 runs the risk of actively increasing its power. That's why special containment procedures dictate that anyone who observes 3930 must be forced to walk into it afterwards, which results in them ceasing to exist. They're destroyed on the deepest level that anything can be destroyed. The very idea of them ceases to be. Another reason that SCP-3930 is so special is that, because it's the largest area of nothing in existence interacting directly with our reality, it's the only place that a huge number of pattern screamers can be directly observed by humans. They're described as being like sentient hallucinations. One researcher suggests that these pattern screamers are created by the way the psyche shatters when brought into contact with raw, true nothingness. The nothingness acts like a hateful mirror to our worst thoughts, reflecting them back at us in the forms of restless screamers. Regardless of what they actually are, one thing is for sure. Coming into direct contact with one of these screamers is a harrowing experience. In the end, it just goes to show that pattern screamers are a complex entity. They can range from microscopic to massive, from pitiful to downright terrifying. And the sad result is that, in either case, nothing can really be done to stop them. It's just as impossible to stop the nothingness existing in SCP-3930 as it is to save the entity trapped in the white spaces of SCP-000. Maybe the best option is to actually be more like Technical Director Rosen. Keep your head down, focus instead on your own petty worries, and bask in the warm bliss that can only come with having no idea what you're dealing with. The one downside is that this may make you a pretty lousy IT guy. Flying in a plane nowadays is about as safe as catching a ride on a bus or commuting on the subway. Of course, that doesn't stop people being afraid of flying. To some, the prospect of long-haul flights or feeling the shudder of turbulence are reasons to avoid planes altogether. And then, every year, there are stories of downed flights or those that go missing, all adding fuel to that aviophobia fire. Take, for example, the infamous Bermuda Triangle, that well-known region of the western part of the North Atlantic Ocean. What does that have to do with the fear of flying? Well, famously, a high number of aircraft are believed to have mysteriously vanished while flying over the Bermuda Triangle. 
Their wreckage and passengers rarely ever recovered. Stories like that are enough to make anyone think twice about setting foot in a plane again. And then, there's SCP-787. As you may have already guessed, SCP-787 is a plane. Specifically, it is a Boeing 747-200, with a wingspan of nearly 200 feet and capable of seating over 800 passengers. The 747-200 is a part of the famous Boeing 747 family of aircraft. These are quad-engine commercial airliners, designed to be the safest ever built. The particular Boeing 747-200 that has since become known by the Foundation as SCP-787 is slightly different from one that might take you from your nearest airport to your long-awaited vacation, though. For one, SCP-787 has no known date of manufacture and no call sign, both which a standard Boeing aircraft would be expected to have. Additionally, the plane's entire exterior has been repainted. Strangely, even the windows have been painted over, and the paint was still wet when SCP-787 was first discovered. As for the inner workings, all of SCP-787's mechanical components, including its turbines, engines, and landing gear, are in perfect working order with no signs of any damage. In fact, the SCP Foundation's researchers aren't even sure that SCP-787 has actually flown since its construction. The plane's machinery looks so pristine that they might be brand new, with no detectable signs of any previous use. However, inside the main body of the plane, it seems to be a different story. Anything not mechanical, like the carpets and seats have decayed over time. Perhaps strangest of all is the cockpit. Both the pilot's and co-pilot's chairs have been replaced with two masses of computer components arranged to take the shape of two chairs. So what, you might be thinking. After all, SCP-787 is, for all intents and purposes, just an ordinary plane. Not enough to put you off flying, right? Nothing more than a Boeing with a few little things off about it, like some missing seats and decaying upholstery. Well, there's that. And then there's the over 500 dead bodies on board. In June 1987, this flight of the dead was discovered several kilometers outside of the city of Bremerton in Washington state. The SCP Foundation moved in, securing the plane and swiftly getting it into containment. Now kept within a Foundation hangar, the interior of SCP-787 is monitored for 24 hours a day. Surveillance cameras and microphones are located within the cockpit, passenger areas, and even the plane's baggage hold, with recorded footage and sound relayed back to the Foundation. The idea of a plane filled with cadavers is certainly unnerving, and more than a little creepy. But why the need for all the surveillance? After all, the bodies on board are all dead, right? Surely they're not going anywhere. Well, let's talk about those bodies. How would you expect someone to die when they are aboard a plane? Maybe they'd be thrown around during a crash landing. Or perhaps a sudden depressurization might cause the passengers to suffocate due to lack of oxygen. Under normal circumstances, you might be right. But SCP-787 is no ordinary plane, and the passengers on board were not killed in ways you might expect from any ordinary aircraft accident. Referred to by research staff as SCP-787-A specimens, the cadavers aboard this particular Boeing 747-200 all have dramatically different causes of death. Some of the specimens show signs of strangulation. Others seem to have starved or drowned. Other bodies on board have injuries like gunshot or stab wounds, while further corpses look to have died as a result of blunt force trauma. A few have even been exsanguinated, that is, completely drained of all of their blood. One commonality among all the specimens on board SCP-787 is that some form of mutilation has occurred. 23 passengers had their tongues removed, a further 73 were scalped, 230 had Cyrillic letters carved into their left hands, and almost 500 of the passengers had their fingertips removed. Let's recap what we have so far. First, there's the Boeing 747-200, found randomly sitting in a field. Second, it's filled with over 500 mutilated bodies. And third, each one appears to have died from a cause you wouldn't typically expect from an airline accident. Seems strange enough. But of course, then there's the apparitions and noises that manifest inside SCP-787, which is why the Foundation keeps the plane under round-the-clock surveillance so they can monitor any anomalous activity taking place aboard this flight of the dead. 
Any attempts by Foundation personnel to enter the plane during an anomalous occurrence have led to individuals being physically ejected from SCP-787, causing severe organ damage and internal bleeding for up to 72 hours. The anomalies that occur inside SCP-787 range from the presence of loud noises with no obvious source to the manifestation of strange human-shaped entities within the plane. The first anomalous occurrence recorded within SCP-787 was in 1988, when the sound of a loud pounding was heard against the doors and windows of the plane's left side. Two years later, a male voice could be heard from the onboard bathroom, repeating a singular phrase over and over. Philosophers always run from the advanced thickening treatment. In 1993, the plane's in-flight entertainment system seemed to be activated by itself. The overhead screen showed a bizarre choice of in-flight movie. Colorless pictures of a deceased man, accompanied by a female voice reading a gynecology book in Czech. The same year, the longest lasting of the SCP-787 anomalies took place. This time, the plane's fastened seatbelt sign spent almost four hours flickering, while the first 15 seconds of Jefferson Airplane's White Rabbit played on a loop over the onboard speakers. It wasn't until 1997 that the first of the humanoid entities appeared aboard SCP-787. This figure was indistinct, lacking any discernible detail, little more than just a human shape standing in the aisles. Observed by the Foundation's surveillance equipment, the figure was seen removing an emergency oxygen supply and mask from seat H-43. It stood perfectly still, wearing the passenger's breathing mask for over two minutes before removing the mask and disappearing from the view of the cameras placed on board. The figure did not appear anywhere else inside the plane. Another figure appeared four years later in 2001, sitting in the mass of computer parts that made up the co-pilot's chair. This figure, much like its predecessor, was indistinct in its features. For almost four minutes, it sat in the cockpit of the Boeing 747-200, just whimpering softly. Then it lurched forward, vomiting all over the console in front of it, before quickly disappearing like the first figure. SCP personnel collected a sample of the vomit the entity left behind. After performing an analysis of the sample, research staff found traces of nitrous oxide, thorium, bird droppings, and three human fingernails. At present, the origin of these humanoid figures is still unknown. Could these entities be the souls of the dead passengers, trying to offer insight into what happened aboard this flight? Or perhaps these indistinct human-shaped creatures are the ones responsible for the deaths of SCP-787's passengers? The next anomaly within SCP-787 occurred in 2005 when a female voice was recorded speaking through the onboard speaker system. The voice said, For your comfort and enjoyment today, pancakes will now be served. Please do not leave your seat. Pancakes will now be served. Please do not leave your seat. Do not leave your seat. Leave your seat. Please. Pancakes will now be served. Yay! Pancakes. Exactly what the relevance of pancakes are to a plane full of bodies is still under investigation by the SCP Foundation. Next, in 2007, the Boeing's overhead emergency air masks fell from the ceiling, only to be snatched back upwards. They continued deploying and retracting for 14 minutes, while the plane was simultaneously filled with the noise of screams. Finally, the only other notable anomaly took place a year later, when the onboard temperature with an SCP-787 dropped 33 degrees from 20 to minus 13 Celsius in a matter of seconds. By the late 2000s, the Foundation's researchers was having little luck understanding the nature of SCP-787's anomalies. Instead, they turned their attention to identifying the bodies of the deceased passengers on board. Through the use of advanced forensics and population databases, these researchers attempted to determine where exactly these bodies had come from. Researchers still haven't determined if they all died on the plane, or if someone had exhumed them from graves before placing them aboard for some unknown reason. In fact, the answer was neither, and Foundation researchers discovered something that no one had expected. One of the passengers was still alive. To clarify, the body aboard SCP-787 was definitely still deceased, but researchers identified the cadaver as a retired optometrist from Atlanta, Georgia, who is still very much alive. 
Foundation agents found the man was simultaneously alive and well in his Atlanta home, but also dead on board the Boeing 747-200. The subject was interviewed by agents, and had no prior knowledge of any incident taking place in June 1987 when SCP-787 was first discovered. Even more interestingly, he claimed that he never even set foot aboard an airplane, which his wife and son both confirmed to be true. So what does this mean? How could the same man have been alive in Georgia and dead aboard SCP-787? Perhaps the answer can be found in a surprising place, the plane's toilet, or to be more specific, the place where the things flushed in the toilet go to. Examinations of the airplane's waste storage tank have revealed something very surprising. There was one more SCP-787-A specimen that had been overlooked. It is unknown just how he got in there, but researchers discovered the body of an Indian man who looked to be in his 30s. The man, who was wearing a three-piece suit, was found to be carrying a number of puzzling items, including a surgical mask and gloves an unloaded Beretta DT-10 shotgun, several cinnamon-flavored mints, a switchblade knife, an amulet that appears to depict the Eye of Horus, and a ticket stub for the Return of the Jedi with the number 92 written on the back. All of these objects seem to be completely random, and the Foundation has been unable to make sense of what they were doing on the man, or why his body does not seem to show the same state of decay as the rest of those found on board. There was one item that may hold some answers, though. For some reason, this man also possessed a copy of SCP-787's flight log. The log consisted of a series of coordinates, which were repeated 5,478 times. The coordinates point to a seemingly random spot in the Pacific Ocean, several hundred miles away from the infamous Pitcairn Islands, the island that the famous mutineers of the HMS Bounty settled after taking over the ship and leaving the captain adrift on the ocean. Is this location the secret to SCP-787? While none of this is confirmed nor denied by anyone at the SCP Foundation, one theory surrounding the area is that the location is another Bermuda Triangle-like location, one that contains some sort of temporal anomaly that unwitting planes fly through, only to find themselves displaced in time. Of course, the problem with this theory is that the man from Atlanta said he'd never been aboard a plane before or at least, not yet. It is entirely possible that SCP-787 is a plane that made a flight at some point in the not-too-distant future, only to arrive back in June 1987 by passing through a temporal breach in the area near the Pitcairn Islands. Sure, it might not explain what happened to everyone on board, but it could at least explain how SCP-787 arrived where and when it did. Every plane is fitted with a device that records flight data, in the event of a crash or other accident, known to most as the plane's black box, and researchers were able to uncover SCP-787s inside a compartment under one of the plane's seats. The recorder was found within a compartment filled with toxic asbestos and dried human blood. They hoped that perhaps it would contain some answers as to what exactly SCP-787 had come from and what had happened to its passengers. Sadly not. The flight data recorder contained no information besides one simple phrase, to be sorry. While an inexplicable mystery, SCP-787 is at least classified as a safe anomaly by the Foundation, seeing as it poses no realistic threat or shows signs of trying to break out of containment. The aircraft has only ever caused harm to anyone trying to enter during one of its sporadic anomalous events, but apart from that, it sits gathering dust in a hangar, just waiting for someone to crack its secrets. And who knows, maybe one day you'll be sitting on a plane that's taking you to your South Pacific vacation, and the retired optometrist sitting next to you will remark that you're passing over the Pitcairn Islands, and you'll discover for yourself exactly what happened to SCP-787. The first thing that tips the Foundation off to SCP-087's presence were the reports of numerous unexplained disappearances on campus. There were plenty of rumors about what might be behind them, but field agents suspected that the true source of the vanishing would be something beyond civilian imagination. All anyone knew for sure was that everyone who had gone missing was last seen in a certain administrative building on the university grounds, and that the disappearances only seemed to happen when the elevator was out. The campus was soon flooded with Foundation agents, creating a barrier around the administrative building and the presumed habitat of SCP-087. Nobody oh. else could get in, and hopefully whatever was inside couldn't get out. One of the Foundation's lead scientists was flown in to consult on the investigation. What could have been behind those students disappearing? 
The doctor's preliminary interviews with university staff who worked in the building yielded some interesting details. Strange noises, like banging and even a faint shrill crying, would be heard from a door that led to a no longer used stairway in hallway 3B. Staff in the building had no reason to ever take these stairs, especially considering how many of them reported a strange sense of unease when just standing outside the door. The only reason someone might take those stairs is due to elevator malfunctions. In that instant, the doctor had put it all together. The staff they interviewed had their memory wiped with amnestics, special chemicals used by the Foundation with the power to delete human memories. The Foundation only used them for staff or civilians who had confirmed contact with an SCP, and the doctor knew that they had a live one on their hands. The staircase. There was something terribly wrong with that staircase, and it was the SCP Foundation's job to find out what before it made anybody else disappear. This is the story of SCP-087, otherwise known as the Endless Staircase, and the three doomed journeys down into its murky depths. The doctor was more than eager to begin research into the staircase and its frightening, anomalous properties. After all, you don't claw your way up to being one of the Foundation's key researchers without being brave and perhaps just a little bit deranged. As was standard, once a perimeter was secured around the staircase, the good doctor requested a selection of D-Class personnel for testing. For those not in the know, D-Class is the Foundation's polite way of saying cannon fodder. The doctor was sent three D-Class prisoners for use in his investigation of SCP-087. The first, D-8432, was, according to official documentation on the incident, a 43-year-old male of average build and appearance and unremarkable psychological background. This man once worked for the Foundation in a more official capacity, but he was given the often deadly demotion to D-Class due to a dangerous mistake handling SCP-682 that led to the deaths of several other agents. Now, it looked like it would be his turn. The doctor explained his mission to him, explore the staircase, gather data, help us find out exactly what we're dealing with here. If you come back alive, there may even be a promotion in it for you. And with that promise, D-8432 was given his loadout, a 75-watt flood lamp with battery power capable of lasting 24 hours, an audio headset, and a handheld camcorder fitted with a transmission stream, and an audio headset that would allow him to communicate with Dr. Bright. D-8432 was then pushed through the door in Hallway 3B and out onto the staircase. According to declassified Foundation files describing the staircase, SCP-087 is an unlit platform staircase. Stairs descend on a 38-degree angle for 13 steps before reaching a semicircular platform of approximately 3 meters in diameter. Descent direction rotates 180 degrees at each platform. The design of SCP-087 limits subjects to a visual range of approximately 1.5 flights. But in D-8432's mind, unlit really didn't seem like the right word. He would have chosen all-consuming darkness. Despite carrying a powerful 75-watt lamp, D-8432 was only capable of partially lighting the platform he was standing on, and the illumination only stretched down nine of the 13 steps to the next platform. When D-8432 observed how little help his lamp was giving him, he was instructed to shine it out of the doorway into Hallway 3B. When he did so, the light seemed to shine far further than it ever could in SCP-087. Already, the beginning of the anomalous activity was obvious. Everywhere else, darkness is just the absence of light. In SCP-087, darkness eats light. It was like a tangible black mass that only a certain amount of light could survive, while the rest just wouldn't show. D-8432 swallowed hard over a lump in his throat. The door to Hallway 3B was closed behind him, and he was ordered to descend. Surviving to see that promotion was feeling unlikely, but it's not like he had a choice. If he tried to escape SCP-087 before he was permitted, he'd be shot by SCP Foundation field agents on the spot. So he followed the high-ranking doctor's orders and began to descend the steps to the next platform. Nothing about the physical makeup of the staircase itself seemed abnormal. The base and walls were a very plain, dull concrete with a metal handrail. The only thing that seemed unique about it so far was the strange light-bending properties. At once, until he reached the second platform down and he heard it, a soft, echoing cry. A child's cry. It was shrieks of panic, or maybe even pain, echoing up from below. He was asked why he had stopped, and he explained the crying sound he'd been hearing. 
It sounded like it was coming from far down the stairs, maybe 200 meters below him. He could just make out the words, please, help, and down here coming from the darkness. But the team outside the stairwell couldn't hear anything, so they asked him to descend further. Another platform down, and they could hear it too, the unmistakable cries of a terrified child. Please, help, and down here. D8432 was ordered to keep going, and only stop if he noticed changes to the visual environment or in the sounds he was hearing. D8432, knowing his life was on the line, had to keep going and descended another 20 flights of stairs before stopping to remark that the sounds of the child hadn't gotten any closer. They still sounded just as far away as when he'd first heard them. He was told his observations were noted and pressured to continue. Within half an hour, D8432 had descended a full 50 floors with no sign of a bottom in sight. Somehow, the volume of the child's crying had remained consistent throughout, as if it was moving away from D8432 at the same rate he was descending. At this point, D8432 reported that he was feeling uneasy. The doctor said that this was understandable, given the circumstances. He'd been watching what little there was to see over a live video feed the entire time, and something about the truly bottomless nature of the staircase and the ever-elusive crying was undeniably eerie. But things were about to really take a turn for the worst. As D8432 stepped forward towards the next set of stairs, he froze. There was something on the platform below him, barely illuminated by the light of his 75-watt bulb. It was a face, vaguely human in size and shape, but with a few terrifying differences. It had grayish skin and no mouth, nostrils, or pupils. And yet, D8432 could feel that this thing was making eye contact with him. He couldn't move, trapped in the thing's piercing gaze. In an instant, the face jerked forwards, suddenly only about a foot away from D-432's face, eyes staring into its own. D-8432 screamed and ran, scaling all 50 flights in an astonishing 18 minutes before charging out into Hallway 3B. There, he collapsed from the exhaustion and the fear of what he'd just seen. Upon reviewing the footage, the strange face was designated SCP-087-1. Fascinating. It was time for a second experiment. The doctor just had to know more. The second test subject was D9035, a 28-year-old male with a history of aggravated assaults against women. He was given the same loadout as his predecessors, except this time with an even more powerful 100-watt bulb. He was also given 100 small LED lights that had adhesive backs and a battery life of approximately three weeks with which they intended to permanently illuminate SCP-087. However, despite the extra wattage of his bulb, he still couldn't illuminate beyond the ninth step. SCP-087 wouldn't allow it. Having no ideas of the horrors that lurked below him, he descended on the doctor's orders and began fixing the LEDs to the walls of each platform he passed. The LED always illuminated the landing, but the light couldn't pass the first step on either side. The flights of stairs themselves would remain in perpetual darkness. After the second flight, D9035 noticed the same crying D8432 had heard and became uneasy. Just like before, as D9035 descended, the volume of the crying didn't seem to increase, as if for every step he descended, the source of the crying descended one, two, keeping them at a constant 200 meters apart. Still, he was ordered to continue his descent and the placing of LEDs even as his paranoia grew. When he reached the 51st floor, he observed damage to the wall and steps. Sections appeared to have been smashed to rubble by an extreme force. As he descended past the broken step, he only felt his fear, anxiety, and paranoia grow. The doctor made note of the fact that SCP-087 seemed to cause instances of anxiety and terror in its occupants, even before they encountered SCP-087-1. As D-9035 reached Platform 89, a full 350 meters under the initial platform, he stopped dead in his tracks and saw something staring up at him from the platform below, that same terrible gray face with those dead, white eyes. He was encouraged to stay calm and try to get better footage of the face, but it charged for him, and D9035 ran for his life. He ascended the staircase at a staggering pace, even passing out from exhaustion and remaining motionless for 14 minutes halfway. When D9035 finally gathered the strength to get up, he scrambled back to Hallway 3B and fell into a state of catatonia. He remains unresponsive to all external stimuli to this day. 
just staring off into the distance with a haunted expression, almost like he's still there in the hallway. The doctor wanted to conduct one more test before he ordered SCP-087 shut off from the world forever, and it was the most terrifying of all. The final subject was D-9884, a 23-year-old woman with a history of depression and use of excessive force. The doctor had hoped that D-9884 would travel the deepest yet, and so he gave her the additional supplies of a backpack containing 3.75 liters of water, 15 nutrient bars, and one thermal blanket. As far as the Foundation was concerned, she was in this for the long haul, but none of them had any idea quite how right they were. When D-9884 entered SCP-087, all the lights from the previous expedition had disappeared. Still, she was ordered to go deeper. She heard the crying of the mysterious child, if it was even a child at all, and again she was ordered to go deeper. At the 496th landing, even as Dean 9884 seemed to slip into a state of mortal terror, once again she was ordered to go even deeper. Every moment, he was hoping to get a better look at the face of SCP-087-1, and when Dean 9884 finally broke and fled back upstairs, he did. The face appeared, but this time it was mere inches behind her, staring directly into the camera with its blank eyes, startling even this veteran of the supernatural. The face appearing caused Dean 9884 to panic and flee, but instead of going back up the stairs to safety, she went deeper down the staircase in an attempt to escape it, deeper and deeper and deeper, until her video feed cut out. Dean 9884 was never seen again. In the aftermath of the tests, the SCP was classified as Euclid, it may have been dangerous, but at least it was easy to contain. The door to Hallway 3B was replaced with one made out of reinforced steel with an electro-release lock mechanism. It has been disguised to resemble a janitorial closet consistent with the rest of the building. The lock won't release unless a classified number of electrical volts are applied, while the key is turned counterclockwise. And after a few inches of foam insulation were applied to the inner side of the door, staff at the building never again reported hearing strange noises. As for the fates of those lost within the endless turning flights and platforms of SCP-087, we may never know, but one can only assume it isn't pleasant. Over 50 men and women, clad in red robes, kneel before an unholy altar. They chant and mutter indecipherable words, words of cruelty and madness, of obsession and sacrilege. Not long ago, these were regular people. Computer technicians, teachers, plumbers, construction workers, accountants. This was before they fell under the ungodly influence of a new ruler. The center of this makeshift place of worship was once a normal school gymnasium, but it's now the home of a huge statue. A humanoid being, wreathed in tentacles, its head is more like a squid or cuttlefish than anything resembling an actual human face. While he's known to the cultists as the tentacled god, the beast they worship is known to the SCP Foundation as SCP-2662, and he sits in the belly of one of their expansive containment facilities, locked away from the world. But not for long, if his devoted followers have anything to say about it. This is their god, all-powerful and unchanging, and when it comes to springing him from containment, no tactic is too vile or underhanded to get the job done. Their mortal leader and high priest, a man in a purple robe calling himself Brother Marsh, walks among their crouched forms. He whispers instructions for the great day of liberation that's soon to come, providing everyone plays their part. It's a plan months in the making, and one that, if it goes off without a hitch, could free their monstrous god into the world. They would strike at the very heart of their enemy, the SCP Foundation, when they least expect it, and nothing shall stand in their way. How could they lose when they have a god on their side? But why did all these normal people become violent zealots for a squid-faced deity? It all began with a dream. To those who experienced these dreams, they felt more like prophecies, premonitions of the glorious horrors to come. A red sky, billions dead and billions more enslaved, a dark silhouette on the horizon, their tentacled god holding dominion over all. At first, it just seemed like a strange nightmare. The ones who experienced it woke up shaken and afraid, hoping to shake the images from their mind, but they couldn't. 
Every night, the nightmare would return. They'd see the images, the red sky, the dead and enslaved, the tentacled god. And after a while, it would come to them even when they weren't asleep, eventually happening whenever they closed their eyes. Little by little, this scene stopped looking so hideous and started to look glorious. They felt his presence in their minds slowly pushing them towards their inevitable future. They started to realize that they wanted him to rule over the universe and to experience the honor of serving him. Many of them abandoned their homes and families, leaving their friends and loved ones left to worry that they'd gone insane. In their eyes, they were safer than they'd ever been. They finally had purpose. They were working in service of something far greater than themselves. The influence of the tentacled god drew them closer to one another. They would meet in secret, exchanging information from the prophecies their ruler sent to them in their dreams. They worshipped together, building altars and idols to congregate around. They performed dark blood rituals involving human and animal sacrifice. It was when Brother Marsh, the Anointed One, arrived to guide them towards their true mission that things kicked into high gear. Just three months prior, Brother Marsh had been an office drone working in data entry for a large insurance company before the tentacled god invaded his thoughts with a simple message. Free me, and the new world I create shall be your playground. Since then, he devoted himself completely to the cause, quitting his job and maxing out his credit cards to help fund his new life's purpose infiltrating the SCP Foundation and releasing his inhuman ruler from its imprisonment. That was the single goal he united the cultists under, freedom for the tentacled god. And at long last, they had all the pieces in place to strike. They'd finally gathered the necessary intel to subvert the will of the most powerful secret organization on Earth. Even the strongest institution is made of people, and people are weak. Unlike the almighty tentacled god, people could be broken. The people in question were Kelly Thompson, Sidney Levitt, Jordan Broche, Dr. Juan Gutierrez, and Jillian Larson. Dr. Juan Gutierrez was a researcher with level 3 clearance on the site where the tentacled god was being contained. Sidney Levitt and Jordan Broche were both security officers charged with verifying personnel clearance on site. Kelly Thompson was a member of site administration with research authorization powers and Jillian Larson was a research assistant who often collaborated with Dr. Gutierrez. These five were the key to getting access to SCP-2662 and bringing their plan to fruition. Normally, personnel dossiers on people working for the Foundation were highly confidential, but the devotees of the tentacled god had their ways. They had a number of computer experts in their ranks, more than capable of hacking in and pulling some basic information off of Foundation servers without being detected. For the other information they needed, they turned to some good old-fashioned torture, which is often the most effective method when you need some quick results. Of course, while the cult's grip on sanity may have been a little tenuous, they weren't stupid. While gathering their intel, they also made sure to find out what exactly they were up against. SCP-2662 was being held in a humanoid containment cell and guarded by on-site Task Force Town 9, better known as the Belligerent Bodyguards. These aren't lazy, donut-chomping mall cops. These are a heavily trained, heavily armed fighting force. Though the cultists had one thing that these Foundation soldiers didn't, the element of surprise. For everything to go off perfectly, Brother Marsh's plans would have to be executed within a single day, and they were already on the clock. Tau-9 had been charged with tracking down any new SCP-2662 cults and dismantling them, and Brother Marsh knew that it was only a matter of time before the Foundation tracked them down and did the same to them. If they wanted any chance of freeing the tentacled god, then they'd need to strike quickly and with overwhelming force. The SCP-2662 worshippers were able to secure the addresses of the five key Foundation personnel and station members outside each of them, including one who could realistically imitate each. They waited for night to fall and broke into each of their homes as they slept. What followed was a sequence of ruthless and efficient murders done in the cause of freeing their god. Dr. Gutierrez was shot in the head while he slept, 
Sidney Levitt and Jordan Broche were both stabbed to death before either even realized what was happening. Thompson, who'd gotten up to use the bathroom, went down in a hail of machine gun fire. Jillian Larson had seen that mask figures were breaking into her home and attempted to flee, but was caught and beaten to death by cultists in her hallway. It was a strange irony that people whose day jobs entailed working with some of the most dangerous and nightmarish anomalies imaginable were murdered in their homes by nothing more than regular humans. So far, Brother Marsh's plan had gone perfectly, with all five key personnel murdered within a two-minute period. Next, the selected doppelgangers stole clothes from their victims' closets and were handed the correct forged documentation. The next morning, each replacement began their journeys to the site where the tentacled god was being contained, while the rest of the cult armed themselves in preparation for their own part in the plan. Nobody at the Foundation seemed to notice anything amiss when the five arrived on site. When you work for the SCP Foundation, more mental energy is devoted to following the rules that keep you alive than to memorizing the faces of all your co-workers, and each one slipped neatly into position, disappearing into the familiarity of office life. But, infiltrating the site was one thing, getting past the belligerent bodyguards and into the cell of the tentacled god would be another thing entirely. That's where the rest of the cult would come into play. Heavily armed with whatever firearms they could get their hands on, the rest of the devotees of the tentacled god, Brother Marsh included, would attack the containment site head-on. In the ensuing chaos, the five cultists who had already infiltrated the site could take advantage of the distraction and break into the containment chamber. It was perfect. They launched their attack from the outside and from within. When Brother Marsh declared that the time was right, the assault began. A legion of gun-wielding cultists seemed to spring out of nowhere and started shooting up the warehouse that was a front for the containment site. The site quickly mobilized guards and task force members to take on the sudden threat, and just as Brother Marsh had anticipated, the site director called on the majority of Tau-9 to help repel the violent cultists from their perimeter. Tau-9 obeyed, leaving three task force members behind to guard SCP-2662's containment chamber. They expected to be guarding the cell from rampaging religious zealots seeking an audience with their god. What they didn't expect was a group of five Foundation employees walking right up to them and opening fire, killing two Tau-9 members and taking the third as hostage. While the war was being waged outside, the infiltrators had found the tentacle god's containment cell in the low-risk humanoid ward. Their hostage insisted that using him wouldn't give them any leverage. The rest of his team would neutralize the whole group, him included, if that's what it took to stop them. The infiltrators explained that using him as leverage was never their intention. He wasn't a hostage at all. He was a sacrifice. The cultists of the tentacled god detonated explosives, creating a hole in the wall and finally giving them access to their deity. They climbed through and gazed upon him in awe. There stood SCP-2662, twice as tall as a regular man, with ten huge tentacles emerging from its back. In their months of envisioning this creature, they pictured it sitting on a throne made of thousands of human bones, ready to dictate its commands to the obedient liberators. What they certainly didn't expect was to see the tentacled god hunched over a computer screen. Still, gods work in mysterious ways. So they stuck to the plan and began chanting. They pulled out a sacrificial dagger and began sacrificing their captured Tau-9 member. It was at this point that SCP-2662 turned and saw what they were doing with a look of pure horror. He rose up from his computer, his headphones getting caught as he did so. He told them to go away, that he didn't want them here, and that them murdering people in his bedroom like this was inconsiderate and disgusting. The cultists became even more confused. Why wasn't their god accepting their offerings? What were they doing wrong? They tried more chanting and painting arcane symbols on the floor in blood, but this just seemed to make the creature angrier. He told them, in a tone more fitting for a teenage boy than a Lovecraftian god, to just leave him alone so he could play his video games. This was seriously not cool. The cultists were baffled. They told the tentacled god that they were there to free him, he replied that he didn't need saving, that crazy stalkers like them were why he turned himself into the Foundation in the first place. Before the cultist infiltrators could get another word in, 
The remaining members of Tau-9 stormed into the containment cell and gunned them down with surgical precision. The war outside was already over. Brother Marsh and the rest of the cultists were all killed in the firefight. Tau-9 didn't look the least bit surprised upon entering 2662's cell. This was a common occurrence, unfortunately. They had to deal with an attempted cult invasion every few months, because SCP-2662's main anomalous ability is inspiring violent cults who relentlessly track down and worship it with arcane and bloodthirsty rituals. The problem is, 2662 doesn't do this consciously, and definitely doesn't like the results. That's why he's under the voluntary care of the SCP Foundation, who keeps him amused with video games and reading material, while fending off the deranged cults who try to invade and abduct him. Following the termination of the devotees of the Tentacled God, just one of many cults who'd broken into 2662's containment cell, the remaining Tau-9 members apologized to the Tentacled creature for the disturbance, allowing him to return to his gaming. They assured him that it'd probably be at least a few more months before something like this happened again. SCP-2662's cell was repaired, and the Foundation returned to its task of seeking out would-be cult emancipators, because for the SCP Foundation, it's not always about the anomaly that's being kept in containment, but what's being kept out. Ever since she was in high school, Faith had dreamed of moving out and finally getting a place of her own. It wasn't that she didn't love her parents. She did, but they were always around, always coming into her room without knocking, telling her when to go to bed, when to wake up, not to eat dinner in front of the TV. In college, she had some welcome independence, but she had to live with roommates. Again, they were perfectly nice people. Some of them she even considered good friends, but she hated having to share her space, having to come home from a long day of classes and see someone else's dishes piled up in the sink, to have someone else's music keeping her awake at night, to delay her morning shower because someone else had gotten there first. So she was thrilled when a few years after graduating, she got a new job at a marketing company that would finally let her afford a place by herself. At last, she could have some peace, some quiet, and most importantly, some privacy. Faith spent all day moving furniture and unpacking boxes, turning the little apartment into a real home. It wasn't much, just a main room she used as a bedroom and living room, a bathroom, and a basic little kitchen. But it was all hers, and all of the little personal touches she'd put together really made it feel like the place was meant for her. There was the orange couch she'd picked up at a vintage store downtown, the coffee table she'd gotten for free from her last roommate, framed pictures of her family and friends, a bed with linens in her favorite color, light blue, and lots and lots of potted plants. Over time, she would find even more things, more little personal touches to liven up the space. Now, how to celebrate her new home? Her gas wasn't on yet, so she couldn't cook anything, but that was the perfect excuse to order in. 30 minutes or less later, she was kicking back on her couch with a large cheese pizza, watching a scary movie on her TV. No one would ask to switch it over to The Bachelor. No one would take the last slice while she was in the bathroom. It was perfect. Finally, a little piece of heaven, an introvert's paradise. As she finished her first meal in the new place, she felt her eyes beginning to grow heavy, the day of strenuous unpacking catching up with her body. Just as she was thinking about calling it a night, a pale-faced monster appeared out of nowhere on screen, terrifying the movie's main character and making Faith jump, spilling her soda all over the coffee table. Damn it! She groaned. Already she'd made a mess, but hey, she tried to look on the bright side. It was yet another first to break in the apartment. She grabbed a kitchen towel to mop up the soda, and when she returned to the main room, she froze. There was something in the window, standing out against the darkness outside. At first, she thought it was a reflection, a trick of the light, but as she slowly approached the window, eyes wide and hands trembling, she got a better look. There was a face, a little difficult to make out, as if it were peering out of the shadows, but unmistakable nonetheless. It was pale, human, vaguely resembling a strange man with dark circles under his eyes, and he was looking right at her. She didn't scream. She was too terrified to make a sound. She stared at the face for a long moment, waiting for it to do something, anything. 
After several moments of the tensest staring contest of her life, she blinked. The face didn't budge. Y you need to leave. She finally spoke, surprising herself as she did. If you don't get out of here, I'm calling the cops. Again, the face did nothing. Do you hear me? Her voice climbed in pitch, her heart pounding against the inside of her chest. Who was he? What did he want? She became vaguely aware of the fact that she couldn't see the rest of the man's body, just his face, looking at her with a neutral expression, a look of vague curiosity, like someone watching a caged animal at the zoo might have. It was then she remembered something that made her blood run cold, made the towel drop from her hands as her stomach sank. She lived on the third floor. Her apartment had no balcony, no fire escape he could have climbed up. Whatever was looking at her through her window, it was no ordinary peeping Tom. She couldn't say how long she stared at the face, its unblinking eyes, its inscrutable expression. She moved closer to the window, step by step, until she was almost nose to nose with the thing. She couldn't think of it as a person, though it looked like one, mostly. She should run screaming out the door, looking for some kind of help, but what would she say? That there was a floating face looking at her through the window? What if it was somehow all in her head? Some sort of hallucination brought on by exhaustion and the stress of the move. She raised a fist and following a passive instinct, rapped on the glass. She didn't know what she expected, for it to blink, to move, to knock back, to say something, but nothing happened. It just stayed there, as if it were part of the window itself. Faith pulled the curtains closed, hiding the strange face from view. With any luck, it would be gone in the morning. She had worked hard to get this apartment, and she would be damned if she let some strange thing, whatever it was, drive her out of her new home. But as she climbed into bed and pulled the covers up to her chin, she could still feel its gaze on her, as if it could see through the thick fabric of the curtains. She rolled over onto her side, her back to the window, and tried her best to forget about it, to shake that horrible feeling of being observed. She lay there for hours, eyes open, heart racing. But finally the exhaustion won, and she slipped away into sleep. She didn't dream at all that night. It was as if she closed her eyes and seconds later, it was morning. She woke to the beep of her alarm, feeling as if she hadn't rested at all. The first thing she did was climb out of the bed and go to the window. Carefully, tentatively, she opened the curtains. She let out a sigh of deep relief. The face was gone. She must have imagined it after all. A bit concerning, but as long as it didn't happen again, she wouldn't have anything to worry about. Lack of sleep does strange things to the mind after all. No longer plagued by the fear of that strange face, Faith hopped into the shower and let the worries of the previous night wash away, disappearing down the drain. She brushed her teeth, dried her hair, did her makeup, and dressed for work. After a banana and a quick cup of coffee, she was out the door. Work was exceptionally busy that day, and it pushed any memory of the oddity in the window out of her mind entirely. She was even feeling good enough to accept her friend's offer to grab a drink after work. They met up at a bar down the street from her new place, sharing cocktails, memories, and a plate of onion rings. It was a perfect, lovely evening. By the time she got home, savoring the click of the key in the lock as she let herself into her quiet little sanctuary, she had completely forgotten about the unusual apparition. She swung the door open and rushed to dump herself onto the couch for a bit of TV before bed. Then, out of the corner of her eye, she saw it, the face back in its previous place, staring at her from the darkness outside. She gasped at the sight, her scream catching in her throat. It was just as she remembered it. Wait, no, something was different. What was it? She clapped her mouth in horror as she identified the change. Its expression was different. Gone was the vaguely interested neutral expression. Now, it was smiling at her. Not a pleasant smile, not a warm, friendly smile. A wicked smile, twisted and cruel. It knew she was afraid, that she'd been hoping it was gone forever, and it was enjoying itself. Her hands were shaking, nervous sweat beating on her brow. What do you want from me? She whispered, staring into its eyes. They didn't move, but they glittered with malicious glee just the same. What do you want from me? She repeated, her voice rising to a shout. Shut up! Her next door neighbor yelled, banging on the wall. It's after midnight! She couldn't bring herself to respond. 
She had more important things to attend to. Her stomach turned, bile rising in her throat. Would the face be gone again in the morning? Would it come back again at night? Was the apartment haunted, possessed by a specter doomed to reside in her window forever? Was that why the rent had been so affordable? Or maybe it was her. Maybe this thing had been drawn to her. Or maybe she was losing her mind. Unaccustomed to living alone, and her sanity was slipping away. She shivered at the thought. What was worse, if the face was on her head, or if it wasn't? Rather than attempt to answer the question gnawing at her, she closed the curtains. Out of sight, out of mind, she thought. She would have to keep the curtain closed, possibly forever. It was better than seeing that damned face grinning that horrible grin. But as she tried to settle in for another restless night, she could feel its eyes boring into her, burning into her skull. She had never felt so uneasy before. She prepared for cockroaches, for black mold, and for burglars, but not for this. This was something outside of her understanding, outside of reality itself. Just don't look, she whispered to herself. Just don't look at it. It became part of her daily routine. Wake up, ignore the window, go to work, try to forget about the window, get home, try desperately not to think about the window. She could always feel it, though. As soon as the sun went down, though, she kept the curtains closed. She knew it was there. She thought about checking to see what face it was making this time, but she couldn't bring herself to look. Gradually, her condition worsened. She woke up to a tightness in her chest, panic attacks that wrecked her body and felt like her heart might stop beating. Her stomach would ache. She struggled to keep food down. One morning, she rushed to the bathroom and spat up blood. The effect began to follow her out of the apartment too, far away from the face's dwelling. She would sit at her desk, struggling to focus on marketing campaigns and pitches, and she would feel a sudden pain in her stomach, forcing her to double over and groan with agony. She would see flickers of the pale face in her peripheral vision turning to look, only to find there was nothing there. When she walked down the hall to the elevator or down the street outside her building, she would feel as if someone was following her. She never saw anyone, never heard any footsteps coming up behind her, but she could never shake off the sensation. Soon, even her formerly dreamless nights of sleep, as fitful as they had been, became unsafe. She would toss and turn, sweating through her sheets, as her subconscious was tormented by chilling visions and terrible nightmares. She would dream of walking down a long, dark hallway that seemed to go on forever, and something coming up behind her, trying to grab her and drag her away. It would chase her, wide dark eyes and long, long limbs grasping at her as she ran and ran but never escaped. Other times she would dream of being locked in a damp basement, chained to a wall as the pale creature sat in a chair across from her, just watching, waiting for something, though she didn't know what. Every night, another nightmare that made her wake up screaming, fighting off invisible attackers. After two weeks of living in hell, she decided to look out the window again. She had to see, had to know. That night, when she opened the curtains, it was there. Mouth wide open, eyes glinting. It was laughing at her. Screw the deposit, enough was enough. She wanted her home back. She picked up the heavy lamp on her bedside table, wound it up, and threw it out the window with all her might. The glass shattered. Little crystalline shards sprang in every direction as the lamp flew through the air, out the window, and down to the street below. And just like that, the face was gone. She checked every other window in place, the little one in the bathroom, the peephole on her door, but it was nowhere to be found. She was free. Her knees gave out and she collapsed to the floor, her face in her hands and wept from sheer relief. Tomorrow she would clean up the broken glass and spin her landlord a story about a freak accident. Someone would come to fix the window, and it would be the best money she had ever spent. Eventually the whole ordeal would fade away from memory like a bad dream, but somewhere out there, Someone else was living the nightmare all over again, looking out a darkened window to see an unwelcome guest, the entity known as SCP-965. SCP-965 is a phenomenon affecting framed windows. When it appears, it manifests in the shape of a shadowy face, belonging to a pale man staring in through the window. The details of the man's face vary from person to person, as well as his apparent age and the direction he is facing. However, all reports point to the same figure at various ages, ranging from 10 to 55. The Foundation has attempted to use facial recognition software to identify a citizen matching the description of this figure, but so far, no one has been found. 
SCP-965 will not appear in just any window. It will only manifest when the lighting on the outside of the window drops below illumination of five candelas. The lighting on the inside of the window does not have any measurable effect. The face will only appear in the confines of a completely assembled window frame, though the window does not necessarily need to be installed anywhere. It will only move from one glass pane to another if its original point of manifestation is destroyed. The face can be seen from an outside vantage point, though it has been described by observers as looking away into the room. When SCP-965 first appears to someone, it produces feelings of unease, anxiety, and low-grade paranoia. Anyone within the visual range of the affected window will experience these feelings, even if the window is covered by curtains or any other means. Any individual that sleeps in an area visible to SCP-965's manifestation point will begin to experience difficulty sleeping, suffering from upsetting and disturbing dreams. However, this is not the endpoint of the entity's impact on those it appears to. At a point between 3 and 10 nights of sleep, after its initial appearance, the entity's facial expression will begin to shift into a noticeable smile. After this shift, the victim's symptoms will become physical as well as mental, including ulcers and intestinal bleeding, heartburn, abdominal pain, and even vomiting blood. This has been attributed to the entity's influence on the human body's reaction to heightened levels of stress and fear. The subjects that reach this stage of exposure to SCP-965 begin to see its face in windows in their dreams, as well as spotting it in their peripheral vision while going about their waking life. They begin to see the face out of the corner of their eye, even when the affected window is nowhere in sight. These additional sightings are accompanied by lingering feelings of paranoia and the sensation that something is following or watching them. Though the entity has never made a sound and does not move while it is visible, it can disappear and reappear in different poses. It has also displayed notable signs of sentience, appearing disappointed when it manifests in an empty room, and angry if it sees someone who broke its previous window. When presented with one of the agents who first brought it into custody, the entity appeared frightened for the first time. Testing involving SCP-965, involving the destruction of its host window, confirmed that a multi-paned window might act as multiple holding zones, but significant damage to its overall structure keeps it from being a viable replacement. In this particular case, the entity manifested in a nearby experimentation chamber's observation window, which was promptly destroyed in order to prevent any potential breaches. For a month following this incident, the entity manifested with noticeably hostile facial expressions, clearly resentful of its treatment. Only one other notable incident has occurred so far during the course of SCP-965's containment by the SCP Foundation. Dr. L, the rest of her name has been redacted from the official file, was the head researcher assigned to SCP-965 for several months before she filed an official request for transfer to a different test subject. She was beginning to experience intrusive visions of SCP-965 and lingering feelings of paranoia, lasting long after she left the Foundation's site. Her symptoms were consistent with those of someone who had slept in the presence of the entity, though she swore up and down she had never napped or slept at all in the vicinity of the affected window. She was temporarily relieved of her duties and provided with psychological care. So far, no other instances of SCP-965 impacting staff who have not slept in its presence have been reported, but this case set an unsettling precedent. The mental health of anyone assigned to SCP-965 is to be strictly monitored in case it expands its influence again. SCP-965 is contained within a framed, ready-to-install window made up of six panes of clear glass or other comparable material at a size of at least 15 centimeters by 30 centimeters. The window must be kept in an environmentally controlled storage facility, capable of withstanding earthquakes and other seismic activity. The window must be inspected at least once a week in order to check the integrity of the material. Additionally, at least two identical framed windows must be stored in the same facility, in separate chambers with additional insulation. Any lighting in the containment chamber should be kept at a minimum of 130 candelas at any time personnel are inside, with the exception of research and experimentation. Though SCP-965 is currently contained, the Foundation is unable to control its movement should its current window be destroyed. Therefore, SCP-965 is classified as Euclid. 
Scopophobia is the fear of being watched or looked at by others. Those suffering from this fear will often avoid windows, terrified of who might be standing on the other side, staring in and keeping track of everything they do. Even those of us without scopophobia might find ourselves feeling a prickle of dread while looking out the window at night, watching for a shadowy figure or a ghastly face pressed to the glass. Most of the time, of course, there is no one there. It's just an overactive imagination, the lingering effect of watching one too many scary movies. But eventually, your luck might just run out. One night, when the world falls quiet and you go to close the curtains before you go to sleep, just in case, you might just feel that someone is right there, on the other side of that thin pane of glass, staring at you with wide, unblinking eyes. It won't ever come inside, but it isn't going anywhere. And as long as you are where it can see you, you will never know peace again. It was November 20th, 2019, and the helicopter circled far above in the freezing wind of the Antarctic. SCP Foundation Site Director Jason Monroe looked down at the isolated, mm. above-ground facilities of Provisional Site 344-1. Something about this place made him nervous, edgy, and for good reason. Between 2003 and 2019, 29 mobile task force units and 73 members of D-Class personnel had gone missing here and never been found. Monroe thought he was here for a routine investigation into negligence and mismanagement, but little did he know, he was in for so much more. This is the story of SCP-5545 and one man's journey into his own worst nightmare, literally. But this nightmare began a long time ago, 300 years to be exact. And like most nightmares, it started as a dream. That dream was one of expansion. National powers across Europe wanted to be the first to conquer the globe and expand into new territories, and sent countless exploratory missions off into the unknown to achieve this goal. Any history book will tell you that the first outsiders to lay eyes upon the continent of Antarctica did so in 1820. The reality is that the first ones to get there actually landed in the late 1700s. The hapless explorers ventured into mainland Antarctica and made base camps, before searching and digging for any useful resources nearby. They came upon a strange discovery, a hallway hidden beneath the ice. Not a passage in the ice, but a true hallway, complete with light fixtures. The confused explorers ventured down into these impossible hallways, and for many of them, it would be the last thing they ever did. No matter how long they walked, it seemed like the hallways just kept going. As they continued to walk for hours, they hoped to find something, anything. And eventually, they did. They passed from these hallways into somewhere different altogether, and most of them were never heard from again. Those who did manage to escape often died or took their own lives soon after. Whatever it was they discovered down there, they didn't want to live with it on their minds. It's believed that over 70 colonial explorers disappeared or died this way, and that most who found these endless hallways beneath the Antarctic ice never returned. The multiple anomalous objects and phenomena that make up SCP-5545 came into the Foundation's hands several centuries later, on September 18, 2003, when during an expedition into the Antarctic, they too found the endless hallways. The Foundation built Provisional Site 344-1 around them, hoping to safely seal them off from any other unwitting Antarctic explorers or researchers. But there was something else lurking beneath the ice in Antarctica, something dangerous. The hallways were designated as SCP-5545-1 and were thought to be the extent of the anomalous activity at the site. But soon SCP-5545-2 was discovered, which resulted in the deaths of 16 researchers. So what exactly is 5545-2? It's an entity so volatile that even knowing about it is considered to be a containment breach. And, as a result, it's kept in Provisional Site 344-2. Unlike Site 344-1, 344-2 isn't a physical space. It's conceptual, accessible only through the endless hallways, created with the express purpose of keeping 5545-1 and 5545-2 separate. Why? Because whenever the two come into contact, the result is 5545-3, the network of endless hallways expanding. If they remained in contact, 
The hallways would continue to expand and the entire planet could be filled with endless hallways in just four to six hours. While the two are apart though, 5545-3 reverses, but it always would take just a few hours to throw the whole world into a chaos of infinite hallways. SCP-5545 has been given the classification safe. Wait, we're dealing with a mysterious and volatile anomaly that claimed a huge number of lives and still somehow eludes true Foundation understanding, yet the official SCP Foundation classification is safe? How could this be? Monroe was the director of Site-58 and was the definition of no-nonsense. Prior to taking the site director position, he was a decorated member of Mobile Task Force Ada-10 and helped contain numerous Keter-class anomalies. He'd been around the proverbial block when it came to anomalous activity, and something about SCP-5545 and the management of Provisional Site-344 seemed awfully suspicious to him. And he had questions. Like how such an unpredictable anomaly could be declared safe, and why had there been such a lapse of communication between the Foundation and Dr. Gabriel Reed, who'd been running the facility for the past two decades? And most of all, just what exactly was the mysterious SCP-5545-2? Monroe started to believe that something terrible had happened at the site, and Reed was covering it all up. But to find out for sure, he'd need to go to Antarctica and investigate it himself. Information about this supposedly safe anomaly was highly classified, those without O5 clearance could face termination for snooping. But that didn't scare Jason Monroe. He dealt with Ketters before. He could deal with this. Or so he thought. Monroe submitted a request and was granted unanimous approval by the O5 Council to travel to Provisional Site 344 and get to the bottom of this mystery. He took a chopper to the base soon after, armed with a concealed firearm and a hostile meme detector or HMD, to test whether the base and its staff had somehow fallen under a hazardous mimetic effect from SCP-5545. He'd find the answers, or die trying. The moment Monroe arrived, he couldn't help but notice the strange way the staff behaved. They seemed listless, almost oppressive. When he showed his credentials to a researcher, they simply said, SCP-5545-2 is contained in Site-344-2. His request to see Dr. Reed that night was denied. Dr. Reed was busy, he was told. Wait until tomorrow. The next day, Dr. Monroe met with Dr. Reed, but the results of the meeting were underwhelming, to say the least. Just like the rest of the staff on the site, he seemed exhausted, as though he hadn't slept in days. His responses were quiet and evasive, and he refused to tell Monroe anything that wasn't in the official files already. Monroe ran the conversation through the HMD and found nothing out of the ordinary. What was going on here? Monroe was irritated, but not deterred. Nothing would stop him from finding out the truth. The next day, he flexed his O5 credentials and hacked into the base's security system. This gave him access to cameras around Site-344-1, but more importantly, there was a single camera inside the mysterious Site-344-2. Jackpot. But when he looked at it, the feed was an entirely black screen with the words SCP-5545-2 is contained in Site-344-2. The footage of the staff in 344-1 was equally strange. The 18 employees on site all sat at computer banks, with nothing but static playing on their screens. Monroe kept digging, though, and was able to hack into the security footage of Dr. Reed's office. As he watched, he discovered a 15-minute period where Reed left the office each day. He could use this brief window to break in and collect more intel on SCP-5545-2. Monroe was so wrapped up in the investigation that he almost forgot the more immediate danger around him and nearly wandered into one of the endless hallways of 5545-1 by mistake. He made a note to be more careful in the future. His first attempt at breaking into Dr. Reed's office didn't produce many answers. One piece of evidence was a blurry picture of what looked like a mobile task force entering a 5545-1 hallway in the dark. Another was a spreadsheet featuring all the personnel, living or dead, who worked at the site, but one name, and the details of whether this person was alive or dead, was completely redacted. Anything particularly juicy was hidden behind O5 clearance. If Monroe wanted the answers, he needed to break through. That night, he had a horrific reoccurring nightmare, one that had plagued him since he joined MTF Eta 10. He dreamed that he was in a fancy dining room with a grand fireplace. The room was full of statues of men and women. The men looked angry, 
and the woman looked afraid. As he approached the fireplace, the ceiling extended infinitely up into the darkness. Suddenly, the zombie-like body of a teenage girl appears in the fireplace, hanging from a long thread. Her eyes look furious and full of rage, and Monroe somehow knows that he's the reason for her hate. When he steps into the fireplace in this dream, she attacks him. The two intertwine, and they burn forever. The one difference was that in this new iteration of the dream, he blinked upon entering the fireplace, and suddenly he was in the hallway. He awoke sure that something was terribly wrong here, but he couldn't give up now. The next day, Dr. Monroe broke into Reed's office and made a horrifying discovery. He found files indicating that Dr. Reed was knowingly sending mobile task forces and D-class personnel into the infinite hallways of 5545-1 to their doom. He also found evidence that Reed and the researchers had been spying on him, somehow intercepting copies of the notes he had been taking. That's when Dr. Reed entered the office and interrupted him. Monroe panicked and drew his weapon, holding the doctor at gunpoint. He was breaking so many Foundation rules, but right now, he feared for his life. The doctor seemed unbothered by Monroe's threats, though. He told Monroe that everything was going to plan, and that he should go back to his room. Monroe was becoming increasingly paranoid. He felt that at any moment, guards might burst in and execute him. Nothing about this place made sense. He worried he was going insane. Perhaps the only way to find answers was to go even deeper. To risk it all, and venture through the endless hallways to find SCP-5545-2 himself, and finally discover what this thing actually was. Monroe left his room and stepped into one of the endless hallways of 5545-1 that was located just across from his dorm. He found that it was a hallway like all the others on site, plain, concrete, worn of age, with simple light fixtures on the walls. He walked for hours, recording with a concealed device. The light suddenly went out, leaving him in complete darkness. When they flicked back on, he was in a very different environment. A grand, old carpeted hallway, the kind you'd see in an old mansion. He broke into a cold sweat. What was so familiar about this place? He kept walking, racked with terror, until this new hallway finally led him to the place he'd been seeking. Site 344-2, the domain of 5545-2. It was a large, poorly lit room, filled with grimacing statues and a large fireplace at the far end. It was the exact same room from Monroe's dream, with one horrifying difference. Monroe noticed a single white thread hanging down from the infinite ceiling, and when he looked up to find its source, he screamed. There were hundreds of bodies hanging and swinging from the ceiling above him, everyone who SCP-5545-2 had ever killed, including MTF members, D-class personnel, and even the colonial explorers from hundreds of years before, and all of them were him, every single one. They had his face, and there, hanging in the middle of the room at ground level, was the body of a teenage girl, the one from his dream. In that moment, he finally recognized her. She was the girl he killed, the first him, hundreds of years ago. Much like Monroe, you're probably wondering, what is going on here? Thanks to declassified communication between Dr. Reed and the O5 Council, we can tell you. Jason Monroe was a man who's been reincarnated hundreds of times over the last 300 years, ever since he murdered a teenage girl, a girl named Emily, his daughter. This murder sparked the existence of SCP-5545 as an eternally reoccurring punishment for his crimes. Since figuring this out, the Foundation has kept tabs on Monroe's reincarnations, whether they're MTF members, D-class personnel, or even site directors. They see to it that these reincarnations always find their way back to 5545-2 to take his punishment and prevent the infinite hallway expansion that threatens to destroy the world. It's a plan everyone is in on, everyone except him. But every time he enters that nightmare haunting room, it all comes rushing back. In that moment though, he knew his crime and he somehow knew how many times this punishment had unfolded for him. He now had two choices. Repent and accept the punishment again, or leave and activate 5545-3, potentially allowing the endless tunnels to expand across the world. Like his many predecessors, Monroe made the decent choice. He accepted his punishment and allowed his own string to coil around him as the lights in the room went off, one by one, leaving only darkness. Jason Monroe, 
That version of him, at least, was never seen again. But the SCP Foundation is already eyeing up his next reincarnation and preparing to let this twisted cycle play out all over again. Nothing in life can prepare you for the raw heat of a house on fire. Throwing an arm up in front of his eyes and clasping a handkerchief to his mouth, Robert Chetford hacked up half of the contents of his lungs. Glancing at the material, he saw that his phlegm was black, poisoned by the smoke. A beam collapsed in front of him, sending a fresh wave of burning air into his face, so hot that it felt like it was going to scorch his ears off. He had to run, he had to get out of the house, but he knew he couldn't. His mother was upstairs. Robert barreled his way through the flames, shouldering open doors and stumbling along hallways. The air was so thick with smoke that he could barely breathe, so he collapsed to the floor and started to crawl on his stomach. He reached the first step of the grand staircase and started to heave himself up one at a time, feeling the heat of the house threatening to engulf him more with every inch he climbed. But he hadn't made it more than five steps before there was an enormous creaking sound, and the whole staircase collapsed beneath him. Sparks rushed up into the air and swirled around the room. Flames licked at the walls all around him. As Robert looked around at the collapsed staircase, he knew that it was hopeless. With tears streaming down his cheeks, he pushed himself forward and ran out of the house. The firemen swarmed past him, filling the building and shouting to one another, but Robert just stood there, staring up at the top floor window. On the other side of the glass, surrounded by billowing smoke, he looked up at his mother, sitting as she always did on her rocking chair, utterly motionless as the house burned around her. In an undisclosed facility in the United States of America, you will find what may well be the lowest security containment cell in the entire SCP Foundation. There is no heavily armored door, no bulletproof glass, no machine guns about to drop down from the ceiling at any point. In fact, there's very little in the way of containment at all. They often leave the door to the cell wide open. There is a window, but on the other side of it isn't a crowd of researchers, security guards, and agents ready to spring into action at a moment's notice. It's just a normal double-glazed window that looks out across a vista of fields, trees, and a couple of power lines. Facing the window is an old armchair in which the concrete man sits, SCP-014. He spends all of his day, every day, staring out of the window. This view specifically was chosen because very little changes in it. Night turns to day, the trees change with the seasons, and it rains occasionally. But there are no roads, no new buildings springing up, nothing to distinguish it from how it looked in 1937. Beside him is a small table, home to a record player. In the corner of the room, there's an antique set of shelves that house three dozen old records, all dated from the 1930s or earlier. All day, every day, the music plays out of the old speaker. Every so often, as researchers walk up and down the corridor, if they hear that there isn't any music playing, They'll come into the room and change the record over for a new one. The newest researchers check in with SCP-014 to see if he's okay. He rarely responds, and so before long, they stop asking. You would think, therefore, that the concrete man is elderly, approaching the twilight years of his life. But the man who sits there in his chair, staring out of the window and listening to music from almost 100 years ago, appears to be just 30 years old. Friends of Robert Chetford reported a noticeable change in his demeanor following the fire and death of his mother. He had lost his father not long before to a workplace accident. William Chetford had been a construction worker, climbing up the girders of New York's emerging skyline, pouring concrete and piling bricks. He had been working on a new building, one that was said to be the tallest in the world called the Empire State Building. Day after day, he would climb the cranes, teeter precariously over the dizzying drops, any slight mistake, and he would plummet hundreds of feet, often to the busy streets below. Sure enough, one day, William Chetford's worst fears came to life. He was walking on a gangplank that wobbled and bent with every step he took. On his shoulders was a metal bar with a bucket of concrete dangled precariously from each tip. He walked this route every day, but clearly, that day proved too much for the wood to take. The board splintered and split beneath him, plunging him down and down through the scaffolding. 
William desperately reached out an arm and managed to grasp the edge of a girder. He hung there helplessly, staring up at his colleagues high above him. He cried out for help, and upon seeing him, they began to scramble down level by level to try and rescue him. He just needed to hang on for a moment longer, and they would rescue him. But one of them knocked over a bucket of concrete. William Chetford could do nothing but watch as the heavy sludge slowly tumbled towards his face. He tried to dodge it, but it was no use. The company told Mrs. Chetford that this had been William's saving grace, that he had been unconscious for the long fall down to the streets below. His fellow workers knew that this wasn't the case. They heard his screams all the way down. Mrs. Chetford didn't believe any of it. They were lying, all of them. The company, his co-workers, everybody. She knew what had really killed him. It was the same thing that was killing her slowly. The same thing that had been passed on to their son. Concrete poisoning. She'd approached the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and any outlet she could, but none of them were remotely interested in the story. There were chemicals in the concrete. It wasn't safe to use. It never had been. She'd been working in nursing homes and seen the effects of concrete on construction workers. They'd become paralyzed, unable to move, spending so many years breathing concrete air, letting it absorb into their skin. Their bodies had slowly started to turn into it. She knew it. She started to go crazy, pinning up news clippings, medical journals, photographs, maps, anything she could find, all over her walls, her entire bedroom. She had red string hanging from the walls and ceiling connecting to every surface. Robert watched helplessly from the doorway, unable to do anything as he saw his mother steadily entering into psychosis. But the further her paranoia went, the less energy she seemed to have for it. Weeks went by, and her manic fervor was replaced with lethargy. She got slower and slower in her movements, talked less and less at mealtimes, and began to sit down for extended chunks of the day. Robert, assuming that she was tired from grief, did what he could to help. He carried an armchair up to her room and placed it in the corner by the window so that she could look out over the world around her. He thought she was resting, but it soon became apparent that she wasn't really resting. She was withdrawing, almost freezing over. Desperate to try and get his mother to re-engage with the world, Robert sat down with her to try and understand all of her conspiracy theories around his father's death. She explained slowly and calmly that the concrete being used in New York was poisoned, cursed. She didn't know where it had been dug up from, how it had been mixed, or who was behind it, but she was getting close. Maybe it was the US government. Maybe it was the same witches. Maybe it was God himself. But she knew her husband, and she knew he wouldn't have fallen that day. He had walked across that plank thousands of times without incident. There was no way he would have made that mistake. Robert tried to connect the dots of what she was saying. Did she really think that it was the concrete that had killed his father? She said that it was and that the same concrete is now killing her. She showed him her hands, turned them over front and back under the light for him to inspect. They looked just like normal hands, elderly, wrinkled, with deep veins popping out, but normal. She scratched at them and tried to feign pain for the effects of her fingers. Look, she said, you see that powder coming off of them? That's concrete powder. But Robert didn't see any of it. The concrete man came to the Foundation's attention a couple decades ago. Construction workers in New York in the late 1990s were hard at work clearing out the foundations for a new skyscraper. The site was built on top of what used to be a residential block. But one intrepid builder soon discovered something that shook him to his core. There was an old cellar beneath where the building used to be. The lock on it was heavy, thick with rust, and had been open for close to 70 years. He and his team managed to pry it open, put on their flashlights, and went inside. What they found was a basement apartment still sitting there beneath the rubble. It was a relic of its time. Thick dust covered every surface, ugly wallpaper surrounded them, and ancient appliances covered with rust sat in the kitchen. It was almost like walking through a haunted house. The builders joked about ghosts stalking these corridors as they made their way through, until they reached the bedroom. Sliding the door open, they faced a man sitting there, staring at them from an old armchair. The four burly builders screamed like little girls for a split second, then burst out laughing when they realized that the man wasn't real. He must have been a waxwork or something. He was sitting so perfectly still and hadn't reacted at all to their presence. They went over to inspect what he was made out of. They tapped on his forehead, 
lifted his arms and dropped them, and were surprised at how convincing the fake man was. That was, of course, until he politely asked them not to touch him. This time, they really did scream like girls, running straight out of the basement into a local police station. This basement apartment was where Robert Chetford moved following the fire in his parents' home and the death of his paralyzed mother. Racked with guilt, he had never been quite able to process what had happened to cause his mother's mental state to deteriorate so rapidly. By the time she died, she had been looking at her hands and genuinely believed they were made of concrete. She would not move, she would not eat, she would not sleep. For days, she would just sit, staring out of her window. He knew he should have taken her to a doctor, but they just couldn't afford it. Maybe if he had, this would have all worked out differently. Robert would think about it hour after hour. He would sit down in the armchair in the corner of his room and ponder what had happened. It was difficult to keep track of time living in the basement. There were no windows, no daylight at all. But he didn't think he had been sitting there for very long when he noticed the skin on his hands starting to turn gray. Without panic, he slowly lifted his hands to his eyes and inspected what was happening. His fingers, down to about halfway through his palms, were dry and solid. He could move them just about, but it took a normal effort, and he could see cracks running along the back of the concrete when he did, so he decided not to. He wouldn't say he felt calm exactly, maybe disconnected. He didn't feel particularly hungry, he didn't feel particularly tired, in fact, he didn't feel much at all. His concrete limbs were only a passing curiosity to him as he sat in his chair. Very occasionally, he would get up to put on a record on his record player, then return to his seat and stare at the wall. That would be every couple of months at most. The rest of the time, he would just sit there. One day, he noticed in a vague corner of his mind that the ground was shaking and dust was filling the room. The ripping sound of dynamite and the heavy stone just above his head told him that the apartment block towering over him had fallen down and almost come through his ceiling. Robert just sat there, unconcerned. Another day, some indeterminate time later, a group of builders came in dressed in peculiar futuristic clothing. With bright yellow hats and reflective vests, they seemed rather startled to see him, though in truth he had little care for seeing them. What did perturb him was when a group of people claiming to be agents from the Foundation came into his room and carried him out. He didn't like the noise, didn't like the change. If he wanted to move, he would move. Not that he could, of course. He was now entirely made of concrete, but that was beside the point. These people put him in the back of a van and drove him across half of the United States. They wheeled him through brightly lit rooms and into a disgusting modern white box. They had done the courtesy of bringing his chair along and found a new record player for him, with a whole selection of albums lining a shelf on the wall. He would have appreciated it and said thank you to them, but he didn't really care. He wasn't present at all. This was, of course, due to the fact that he was made of concrete by this point. However, once he was sat in his chair and took in the sight in front of him, Robert Chetford felt a dull panic rising in his chest. They placed him at a window, just like he'd placed his dying mother in front of a window. He tried to clench his jaw, tried to move his hands, tried to cry out in fear and pain, but he couldn't. He was paralyzed. The smell of smoke filled his chest, choking him, torturing him as the memories of his burning household raged in his mind. He tried to scream. He tried to fight. He tried to do anything other than just sit there, but it was far too late for any of that. Good afternoon, Mr. Chetford, the researcher said, busying herself and putting on another album for him to listen to. Is there anything I can do for you, sir? Anything I can do to make you more comfortable? The concrete man said nothing. The researcher patted him on the back of his hand. Made of concrete indeed. Looks just like regular skin to me, Mr. Chetford. I do wonder what's going on inside that head of yours. On her way out of the room, she glanced at his view from the window. Beautiful weather outside today, isn't it? Scorching even. When you work for the SCP Foundation, one certainty is that nothing, no turn of events, no scenario, is ever really unexpected. No matter how unlikely something may appear, chances are it usually happens. And if it doesn't happen here, then in an infinite multiverse of alternatives, everything that can possibly happen is statistically likely to. We've covered a few of these alternate eventualities before, a number of which revolve around the differing events in the long life of one particular anomaly, SCP-076-2, better known as Abel. 
In our home universe, much like he is in many others, Abel is considered to be a near-perfect warrior. His body, covered in tattoos of occult symbols and demonic faces, is capable of withstanding vast amounts of physical damage. Abel can easily take hits from the most powerful conventional weapons mankind has to offer and survive with little more than a scratch. What's more, he can draw an endless supply of black-bladed weapons from a tiny pocket dimension. And on top of all of that, even in the event that he's bested in combat, Abel's body will rapidly disintegrate, only to reform within a large stone cube known as SCP-076-1. Like most of us, Abel has a number of almost identical counterparts that exist across the various worlds of the multiverse. One of them once had the opportunity to reconcile with his brother Cain, the man seemingly responsible for Abel's endless life of bloodshed. And once the two brothers had made peace, they could rest. In another universe, Abel worked directly with the SCP Foundation as part of a mobile task force until they turned on him. This unfurled a chain of events so cataclysmic that the entire world suffered the consequences. This alternate Abel went on a warpath against the Foundation, ultimately using SCP-914 The Clockworks to refine his destructive anomalous abilities. This allowed him to unleash chaos, slaughtering all of humanity in an omnicide that wiped the world clean of all other life, leaving Abel alone in a dead world. And then there was this version of the Immortal Warrior. Far from the Clockworks Enhanced Conqueror that his alternate universe counterpart was, this Abel had long since been removed as a member of MTF Omega-7 and was gradually reconstituting his body within SCP-076-1. His most recent defeat had enraged the warrior, and he had vowed to once again be free. Although unbeknownst to him, what set this particular version of Abel apart from his other variants was the fact that he would soon encounter a certain other anomaly, something that when wielded by SCP-076-2 had the potential to completely rob him of all his centuries worth of fighting ability and replace it with an embarrassment that would last for centuries more. But first, a quick history lesson. Much like it had been in our universe, this particular anomalous object had been recovered by the Foundation after it made its way into the hands of an unwitting police officer. The item in question was SCP-572, a particularly unique katana, unique in that it was utterly useless for fighting with and caused more harm to the person wielding it than whoever they were trying to use it against. In this universe, the sword had already changed hands a number of times. When police were called to the home of one Clarence Clancy Clancerson, he drew SCP-572 in defense and screamed at the officers that he would, quote, take their heads and with it their power. The cops who had been sent over to arrest Clancy for violent and disorderly behavior were less than threatened to see their suspect, who was somewhat out of shape, coming at them with a weapon no sharper than a butter knife. After pacifying Clancy with tasers and beanbag rounds from a 12-gauge shotgun, the police retrieved SCP-572, and then it was acquired by a Foundation operative. This all played out almost the exact same way in our universe. However, in this version of events, there was one key difference. As previously mentioned, SCP-572 was an unremarkable sword, but it had something of a storied past, passing from one unfortunate user to the next. And just as it was recovered from Clancy's house and ended up in Foundation hands, one of those former owners had just been about to reclaim the fabled weapon for himself. Meanwhile, back in this containment chamber deep under the ocean, still trapped in the stone cube he reanimated within, Abel was lost in a dream. To any other person, falling asleep to see subconscious visions of so much carnage would be horrifying. They would call it a nightmare. But to Abel, this might have been one of the sweetest dreams that he had ever experienced. All around him was a world on fire. Having returned to life once again, Abel at last bested his captors at the SCP Foundation. In his dream, he traveled the world, visiting every Foundation facility one by one and reducing them to rubble without leaving a single survivor. Then, once the work was done, he turned his barbarism towards the wider world and began slaughtering humanity in droves. 
Perhaps some distant cosmic echo had reached out across the multiverse. A fragment of the life of a more refined version of himself had slipped into Abel's subconsciousness, making him dream that he, too, was the omnicidal conqueror that his other self was. Seeing such devastation in his own wake made this version of Abel eager to wake up, to revive once more, and set about making this delightful dream of destruction a deadly reality. It was while Abel was dreaming, picturing himself cutting down all who dared oppose him, that something strange seemed to happen. He had a visitor, not a visitor to his containment chamber, mind you. There was no one beyond the confines of SCP-076-1 except the security team that normally kept the stone cube under armed surveillance. No, this visitor appeared somewhere else, inside Abel's mind, approaching him as he slept. Within the warrior's slumbering fantasy, he was climbing up a mountain of skulls after having slaughtered millions, if not billions, already. But as he reached the top of the pile of bones and looked out over the horizon, Abel could see that the world beyond was still living. There were just as many people alive, perhaps even more that he'd already killed. His work was not yet done. In fact, it seemed that despite all the lives the immortal madman had already claimed, he had barely even begun. Oh, Abel, a voice tutted. Did you really think you could do it alone? Even though this was a dream, Abel could feel the presence of another. He pulled one of his obsidian-edged weapons from thin air and swiped in the direction the voice had come from, hitting nothing. The blade in his hand seemed to change, its dark metal transforming from solid to liquid. Coming apart in his hands, Abel's sword melted like candle wax under a hot flame, reduced to nothing in seconds. You can't do it, the voice whispered. You aren't strong enough, but I can help with that. Pulling out another weapon, a two-handed axe this time, Abel looked around him, trying to locate the source of the taunting noise. Only a coward relies on cheap tricks and illusions, he growled angrily. Show yourself! Come forward and be slain! Are you a worthy opponent? Are you worth your time? Are you? The voice jested. We shall see! Abel yelled. Behind him, a cloaked figure silently appeared. They looked to be adorned in a robe that whipped in the biting cold wind, yet their garments weren't made of any fabric. Instead, they wore a robe made out of pure shadow. Their clothes and body comprised of the same thing. Though they lacked any tangible solid matter, it didn't stop Abel from spinning around, swinging his heavy axe in the figure's direction. Before the blade of the weapon was even halfway through the air, it had already started to become liquid, just like the swords had earlier. By the time it came down to strike at the shadowy visitor, what had once been an axe was just a flick of melted black metal, passing through the intangible specter as Abel found himself once again unarmed. Speak, Creighton, he demanded, never one to back away from a fight, even when his weapons were seemingly failing him. Tell me who you are. I would like to know my adversary's name before I end your worthless life. I am not here to fight you, the figure replied calmly. I'm here to offer you the key to your victory, Abel. What key? The warrior sneered. What could you possibly give me? Exactly what you need to finish it, the shadow replied, drawing something from a sheath on its belt and holding it aloft. A weapon that will allow you to become the conqueror you long to be. Abel looked at the object in the figure's outstretched hand, a katana, or at least the shadowy vestige of one. A sword? He sneered. What use do I have for a sword? I can conjure all the blades I need at will. To demonstrate, Abel pulled one of his own black blades, but yet again, it began to melt away. Your weapons have served you well, but they are disposable, the shadow explained. A true warrior deserves a sword worthy of his fighting prowess. I have killed scores of men throughout the ages, the immortal warrior retorted. And I never needed any special sword to do that. And that is why, no matter how many you kill, you will always be beaten. In his dream, Abel paused a moment, looking at the katana and considering. Then he reached his hand out to grip the shadowy hilt. In that same split second, SCP-076-2 awoke once again from his slumber and broke free of the stone cube encasing him. As he killed his way through the Foundation personnel in the facility housing SCP-076-1, Abel had only one thought in his mind. He needed that sword. You see, what the immortal maniac was unfortunately totally unaware of 
was the interesting effect SCP-572 could have on people. As well as being a totally useless sword, anyone who picked it up will instantly believe the katana of apparent invincibility to be an all-powerful weapon of ancient legend. Despite the sword being crudely made, blunt, and generally unfit for any use, the wielder will maintain the belief that it not only has perfect balance and cutting power, but that the sword has also imbued them with unparalleled strength and invincibility to damage. And now, either through the sword itself extending this cognito-hazardous influence into Abel's dream, or by the interference of some unknown trickery, one of the most dangerous anomalous killers in the world was making a beeline straight for SCP-572. And he wasn't the only one, either. At a previous point in time, a man by the name of Zack had purchased SCP-572 on eBay, but it was far more than just an oddity to him. He wasn't looking to start a sword collection. As a child, he had been obsessed with comic book superheroes, and when Zack bought that katana, he intended to use the blade to dispense a vigilante justice against those who preyed on the innocent. And even before he held it in his hands, Zack too felt the anomalous pull of the katana knowing in his heart it was the perfect weapon to transform him into a hero. Of course, he had quickly been disproven when, on his first night of crime fighting, Zack had been hit by a mid-sized sedan in a multi-story parking lot and suffered a concussion. Sent to the hospital and then charged with attempted assault, Zack had long since lost any and all interest in ever donning his costume, comprised of hockey pads and a ski mask, or picking up the sword ever again. But as time had gone on, that old familiar pull had started to gnaw at Zack, urging him to get back in the superhero game, forgetting how poorly that had worked out for him last time. One problem still stood in his way, though. He needed his trusty sword back. Of course, in the time since he'd hung up his hero outfit, Clancy had gotten his hands on SCP-572. And then right before Zack could steal it back, the Foundation had taken it. It had taken him months of preparation, He'd sneakily made dealings with a janitor that worked at one of the Foundation's sites. Zack had bribed the man a lot of money in exchange for his keycard and uniform, even having to take out a second mortgage on his apartment to meet the frankly extortionate amount the janitor asked for. But it would be worth the cost, Zack told himself. If it reunited him with his trusty katana, then it would be worth it. Only then would he once again be a full hero. Shuffling through the facility, Zack dragged a mop over the floor, leaving a sign to warn the slippery hazard. He whistled to himself, trying to act as casually as possible, not realizing that he was slightly overselling it. Once he was certain the coast was clear, he made his move. SCP-572 was locked in a secure deposit box within Site-19's high-value item storage facility, right where he had been cleaning. He began searching through the various anomalous oddities kept there, until he saw it. The box containing his coveted sword. All his effort in infiltrating the Foundation had finally paid off. It was all leading to this, his comeback in crime fighting. It was at this precise moment that Abel came bursting through a nearby door. Completely befuddled, Zack quickly found himself thrown to one side by the much stronger man. Out of my way, weakling! Abel roared before turning to face the deposit box holding SCP-572. Gripping the box, Abel used his superhuman strength to tear it open, as though the container was made from cardboard. There it was. Stored safely within was the weapon he had been seeking, the same all-powerful sword from his vision. At last, he declared, reaching for the hilt. This sword belongs to me! The second that Abel hoisted it into the air, he felt a human weight dash towards him, only to shrug it off as it made impact. Zack tumbled to the floor, winded as Abel barely flinched at the attempted tackle. You fool, he roared. You dare come at me? You'll be the first to fall to my new blade, the first of this pathetic world of unworthy opponents to die in my conquest. Zack frighteningly raised his arms in an attempt to shield himself. When Abel raised the sword menacingly above his head, the mortal man knew what the sword was capable of, or so he thought. As Abel brought the blade swiping downwards, its true ineffectiveness as a melee weapon was on full display. SCP-572's dull, poorly balanced blade barely grazed Zack's arms as he protected his face. In fact, beyond the initial swat, it barely hurt. Uh, I, I don't understand, Abel stammered, looking at the katana in confusion. This is meant to be a warrior blade, a weapon of champions and conquerors. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. 
Zack replied, also suffering from SCP-572's cognitohazardous effect. He'd fully expected to die a second ago, slain by the very weapon he had been hoping to reclaim. Still, maybe it's just because it's your first go? I, I could show you how to- Silence! I will not fall for that, Abel interrupted. Let me see here, maybe the angle was off? Or how about I use both hands here, let me just- Once again, Abel hoisted the weapon, this time with both hands tightly gripping the blade intending to bring it slashing down in a big swing like a woodsman cleaving a log in two. Unfortunately, as he raised the sword, the blade caught an exposed light fixture above. Sparks burst from the ceiling as an electrical current shot through the metal and gave Abel a nasty shock. Oh, God, what is the meaning of this? He shouted in frustration. I've been alive for centuries, killed thousands upon thousands of men since the dawn of civilization. Why can't I use this sword? Well, performance issues for a guy your age? Eh, hardly an uncommon problem, Zack joked. Both turned at the sound of a door kicked open, the clomp of heavy boots on the ground as a Foundation security team burst in. SCP-076-2, drop your weapons and- The commander stopped mid-shout. Wait, that's not one of his regular swords, is it? Sir, um, <clears throat> that's, uh, one of the officers paused and sighed. I think that's SCP-572. Attack me! Abel yelled at the Foundation officers, pointing the dull tip of the katana at them. If you dare, for now I wield the greatest blade known to the universe. You will all fall in a single stroke of my new weapon. And once you have fallen, so shall the world! SCP-076-2. Abel, look, just put the thing down. The commander urged. Uh, trust me, you'll, you'll thank yourself. <laughs> you pathetic fools are so afraid of the chaos I will unleash, the warrior declared. Such unworthy opponents! Okay, I've seen enough. The security commander sighed. Deadly force authorized! Light them up, boys! On the commander's signal, a hail of gunfire erupted. Bullets rang down on Abel. He slashed SCP-572 through the air, certain that what he thought was a mighty sword could easily cut through the oncoming bullets. Of course, that may have been true, if SCP-572's only real power was not having any power at all. Each shot struck Abel's center mass, barely damaging him given his body's natural resilience to harm, particularly from such small arms fire. Although, he didn't find it any less annoying that he couldn't seem to properly wield his new katana. Oh, are you kidding me? He huffed to himself. What is with me today? Can't get the hang of this thing. Come on, Abel, it's still a sword. The weapon that will allow me to conquer this whole world, but if I can just get the swing right! Calmly knowing that the weapon itself posed no threat, even in the hands of an immortal mass murderer, the security team moved in to apprehend Abel. Before they could take the katana from his hands, he dashed towards them, swiping the sword back and forth, hoping to at least hit someone to get the ball rolling on his omnicidal rampage. Instead, thanks to the influence of SCP-572, he miscalculated, took a wrong step, and slipped over on a patch of freshly mopped tile, landing in a heap next to a wet floor sign. The security team all winced, feeling the second-hand embarrassment practically radiating off of Abel as the ancient anomalous warrior lay on the floor after a spectacular fall. Then, one by one, they all burst out into uncontrollable fits of laughter. But while they were distracted, they were completely oblivious to Zack, who emerged from his hiding place and picked SCP-572 up off the floor. He breathed a sigh of relief, reunited with his prized weapon, having forgotten the severe injury it caused him last time. You, Abel wheezed, still lying in a puddle of mop water. Who are you? Zack gave a slight smile, unzipping the janitor's overalls he had on to reveal a set of hockey pads underneath. He slipped a ski mask over his face before turning back to Abel and replying in his most epic voice, I'm Captain Katana. Unfortunately, his return to crime fighting would be as short-lived as Abel's own turn with SCP-572. As Captain Katana found himself hit by a bus on his way home after trying to use the katana of apparent invincibility to cut said bus in half down the middle and failing in a rather painful fashion. A shot zipped past his head, narrowly missing, leaving an indent on the wall mere inches away. He froze, peeking out from cover, scanning the area for any sign of the enemy. Nothing, not a single movement, but still, he didn't feel the least bit safe. There was a more secure stronghold, a bunker only a short dash from where he was squatting. Gripping his weapon close to his chest, Private Mitchell took a deep breath, 
psyching himself up before rushing across the battlefield towards what he hoped would be better cover. Ducking under a camouflage tarp that covered the entrance, Mitchell was met with a sight of his squad mates, all sitting huddled in the foxhole, some looking dejected and miserable, others cowering in fear, all apart from Sergeant King, who sat cross-legged in one corner, wearing a permanently crazed, wide-eyed stare on his face. An exhausted Private Mitchell sat down with the others, unable to offer more insight than a nod of mutual condolence to his comrades. For a while, the members of MTF IOTA 17, the unit codenamed the Greendale Humans, found themselves feeling the simultaneous mix of frightened and bored. Each one of them could have achieved the same sense of anxiety by drinking 10 cups of black coffee, loudly knocking on their drill sergeant's door in the middle of the night, then rushing back to their barracks to hide under their bunks. Movement from outside caused the whole team's heads to swivel, peeking out of a gap in the outer wall of the bunker. They saw the enemy immediately. Two of the ghostly incorporeal figures roaming the battlefield outside. Not to be underestimated despite the baggy, oversized tactical gear they wore, and weapons that looked too big for them. And two outside meant the other three were still out there somewhere. One gave a nod to the other, instructing him to scour the area surrounding the bunker. Mitchell was terrified, and all too aware that there were too many of them in the bunker. The enemy was bound to find them soon. All of a sudden, Sergeant King seemed to stir from his strange trance and produced a box of matches. He held out four in his hand, keeping them covered so that nobody could tell if they were picking a long one or a short one. The first of MTF IOTA 17, Private Davis, reached for a match as they were offered, his heart dropping as Sergeant King pointed it was a short one. Next, Private Byron picked out a match, a long one. Private Mitchell's pulse skyrocketed as Sergeant King offered him the remaining two, knowing that one would be long, the other short. He reached out and plucked a short one. King explained that the first short straw and the first long strong go. Bad luck, Byron and Davis, but I don't make the rules. Byron, not wanting to be at the mercy of the spirits, protested that those rules seemed made up. But Private Mitchell, even less eager to go out there, affirmed the sergeant's logic. Hanging their heads, both Private Byron and Private Davis gathered up their weapons and sluggishly walked out of the bunker. Moments later, still safe inside, Private Mitchell overheard the enemy taking fire, followed by the sound of splattering and yelps of pain from his two fallen squad mates. He offered a concerned look to Sergeant King, whose wide-eyed expression was doing little to ease Mitchell's nerves. They got our voice good. King muttered, rocking slightly, tagged them like the Bowery Wall. Still, lucky they didn't get hit by the cannonball. Mitchell asked in disbelief whether the enemy really had their hands on a cannon. No, no, the cannonball's just their name for it, the sergeant said solemnly. I've never seen it myself, but I heard rumors. Apparently these incorporeal delinquents sneak a steel ball in with their ammo. <laughs> That's their way of keeping things interesting. Who was it that said war is hell, or was it war makes people crazy? <laughs> crazy. I was crazy once. Mitchell sighed and asked why they don't just throw in the towel and surrender. You know darn well why. The mad commanding officer barked. Chaos, mass hysteria, a whole new mess for the Foundation to clean up. And you listen here. Maybe you can live with that, but not me. Not on my watch. The private asked to be let in on the battle plan, unsure if he was more scared of Sergeant King or the enemy outside. We should drag one of them in here, get him to give up enemy intel, King answered in a sinister, unhinged tone. He didn't respond well when told that the intangibility of the enemy may make holding one of them hostage, well, impossible. Still living in a fantasy, are you, Private? King chuckled maniacally and didn't stop for a full, unsettling minute. Look, I've had it up to here with the enemy and their dirty tactics. I say it's time we went full Return of the Jedi. We're the Ewoks and they're the Empire, now belt up and bear out! Grabbing his weapon, Sergeant King suddenly hopped to his feet and bellowed, letting out a primal scream up towards the heavens. Then he rushed out of the bunker, screaming his own name until a barrage of enemy fire opened up from all directions. Still cowering in the safety of the bunker, Private Mitchell sighed again as he looked at his commanding officer covered in splatters of paint. Fortunately for Mitchell and the rest of MTF IOTA 17, the injuries they had sustained in the line of duty were non-fatal, save for a few bruised egos and some stubborn paint stains on their uniforms that took a lot of seltzer water and lemon to wash out. The unfortunate downside, however, was that their defeat led to a localized anomalous event. The perpetrators of that incident? Five ghost-like entities with a bad habit of painting the town red. 
literally. Meet SCP-2629, sometimes more commonly referred to as the 29-Year Paintball War. See if you can guess how it got that nickname. Located on the outskirts of Krakow, Poland, one can find an abandoned building that was previously used as an indoor paintballing venue. But now it's known to the SCP Foundation by its designation of SCP-2629. Inhabiting the location are a number of incorporeal entities, collectively known as SCP-2629-A. These are humanoid in their shape and behavior, but largely intangible. However, there are a few caveats to that which we'll circle back to. As for their appearance, despite being somewhat translucent, facial recognition software deployed by the Foundation has determined that these so-called ghosts bear a resemblance to a group of five teenagers, all of whom died during a driving accident. According to local police records, these deaths took place approximately five kilometers outside of Krakow, and there are no existing records that indicate the teenagers in question ever frequented the paintball venue, while they were alive anyway. Now, we mentioned not too long ago that these five entities aren't entirely incorporeal, or at least, they aren't 100% intangible. The exceptions here are the projectiles fired from their weapons. In this case, standard paintballs with no anomalous properties remain physically tangible. They interact with the world in the same way you would expect any normal paintball to, splattering on impact with solid matter, usually a hard surface or a human target. And this exception to intangibility also works the same way in reverse. Any paintballs fired at any of SCP-2629-A will have the same expected effect. Any and all attempts by the SCP Foundation to engage in direct communications with SCP-2629-A have resulted in failure. While they will often engage in banter and trash talk with their opposition during games, they seem to be uninterested in talking about anything other than paintball. During one attempt by Foundation researcher Dr. Ben Kazarinsiak to talk with the entities and ask why they spend eternity in a paintball arena, the only answer given by one of the anomalous ghosts, SCP-2629-A-2, was, why not? Every afternoon at exactly 1 o'clock Central European time, all members of SCP-2629-A will manifest within SCP-2629. Should they be left unattended, they will begin to roam freely often gravitating towards the nearby neighborhood. This can lead to an event classified as an ALIF-2629 scenario. However, the occurrence of an ALIF scenario can be averted should the five entities be engaged in a game of paintball. It is the only known measure to deter them, and as such, the SCP Foundation has assigned Mobile Task Force IOTA-17 to deal with the problem. Every day, all members of MTF IOTA-17, the Greendale Humans, enter the paintball facility via an underground tunnel. Each of these operatives possesses a high level of proficiency in marksmanship, as well as close quarters combat utilizing firearms. On top of that, the Foundation insists that MTF troops in this unit also need to be great at paintball. The Foundation's MTF agents must engage the five members of SCP-2629-A in a game of paintball shortly after the entities manifest at 1 o'clock. The games follow the traditional capture the flag rules, wherein both teams have a flag that they need to protect while also being tasked with securing the opposing team's flag. Should the Foundation's pro paintballers be successful in winning the match, then all instances of SCP-2629-A will demanifest peacefully until they return at the same time the following day. But should the five ghostly teammates prevail, or if MTF IOTA-17 breaks any of the conventional paintball rules, then this will trigger an ALIF-2629 scenario. But exactly how long has this protracted paintball war been going on for? Well, the clue is in the nickname. All the way back in 1988, the SCP Foundation received reports of unusual vandalism taking place in the area near Krakow. That might have been enough to pique their initial interest, but the sudden reported sightings of ghosts by local civilians was what really made them take interest. Descending on the small area outside of Krakow, the Foundation launched a full-scale investigation into SCP-2629. Given what we now know about the anomaly, it seems that with no one to challenge them, the five paintballing entities were free to enact an ALIF-2629 scenario unobstructed. Once the Foundation discovered the site of SCP-2629 and determined it to be the source of the local anomalous activity, they got to work evacuating the immediate vicinity of the abandoned paintball arena and devising containment procedures to keep unwitting civilians from getting caught in the crossfire of an imminent paint-slinging conflict. As far as the public would know, the abandoned SCP-2629 venue was shut down thanks to a hazardous amount of asbestos. 
Its entrances were sealed off to deter vandals and would-be urban explorers, but in reality, the Foundation was keeping people out so that the first match between their team, MTF IOTA-17, and the five members of SCP-2629-A could commence. The battle was relentless, paintballs flying in all directions, splattering any in their path. The Foundation lost a lot of good men that day, although they quickly found them again once they'd cleaned up all the paint. In an attempt to shift the tide of battle and turn the odds in the Foundation's favor, MTF operatives rearranged some of the indoor playing field. This, however, was an ill-advised strategic misstep, as messing with the venue's cover violated the established rules of paintball, and doing so caused an ALF 2629 scenario to begin. In response, a number of ALF 2629 procedures have been put in place to combat the anomalous event. Staff at Site-19 had to equip the protective paintball and gear stored at their workstations or in lockers around the facility. If any of them couldn't access their gear, the next best thing Foundation personnel could do was cover their eyes and ears until the event passed. Any and all delicate equipment had to be stored for safety purposes. Security staff are tasked with making sure any SCPs that might be vulnerable are kept out of harm's way. The Foundation currently has no way of barring SCP-2629-A's access to areas, thanks to their incorporeality. However, they can be deterred by being presented with an abundance of targets. Staff are to remain on high alert until the ALF-2629 scenario is over, and the all-clear signal sounds. With all this preparation taking place at Site-19, no less, you'd expect an ALF-2629 scenario to entail something pretty catastrophic. It wasn't always such an issue. During the initial decade following SCP-2629's discovery, the ALIF scenario used to entail the five SCP-2629-A entities roaming the nearby area of Krakow and opening fire on people and property with their paintball guns. Hardly a paint-based war crime, but definitely goes an unnecessary extra mile in terms of vandalism. Then again, you try being stuck for an eternity in a paintball arena. Sometimes it's nice to stretch the invisible space where your legs used to be. And by now, you've probably made the connection, the unusual vandalism that drew the foundation to SCP-2629 in the first place was the ghostly teenaged paintballers literally painting the town whenever they manifested, only to fade away after a few hours. But that's only what the ALIF scenario used to entail. It happened during the 12th consecutive year of the paintball war. A third MTF loss against SCP-2629-A caused yet another ALIF scenario to activate, but this time, instead of roaming the local neighborhood, the incorporeal team's victory sent them to one of the Foundation's most highly guarded facilities, Site-19. Multiple unsuspecting Foundation research personnel were splattered with paint, the first of the Paintball War's casualties to fall outside of a 250-meter radius from SCP-2629. The Foundation launched an inquiry into how these five incorporeal anomalies were able to breach the security of Site-19. Citing loose lips among MTF IOTA-17 about Site-19. As such, they were banned from ever mentioning Foundation operations during their paintball skirmishes with SCP-2629-A. However, the lasting damage was already done, and unlike a paintball splatter, there was no wiping this away or covering it up. Every loss that MTF IOTA-17 incurred in the coming years would result in all five of SCP-2629-A manifesting within Site-19 celebrating their Capture the Flag victories by committing paintball retribution against Foundation personnel. Staff and corridors were splattered with paint, and attempts to return paintball fire were unsuccessful in dispersing the incorporeal attackers. One researcher even sustained an eye injury after being struck in the eye by a stray paintball. As the years rolled on, MTF IOTA-17's losses began to increase rapidly. More and more ALF-2629 scenarios were occurring each year, Foundation facilities abruptly and messily redecorated by a volley of paintballs. The Site-19 director issued a communique to the Ethics Committee, requesting the termination of SCP-2629. MTF IOTA-17 may have some of the best trained people in the world, but SCP-2629-A have been gaining experience for decades. It was only a matter of time before the skill gap closed. Anyone we recruit to fill a vacancy in MTF IOTA-17 is going to need to be able to counter nearly 30 years of paintball experience, and that number is always growing. All five of SCP-2629-A had already gotten tired of trashing their own neighborhood, and before long, they'd similarly get bored of trashing Site-19. The question was, once that happened, where would they hit next? Nobody should ever have to find out what a human body smells like especially as it's being eaten. Sally clasped both hands over her face, 
trying desperately to block out the smell and to trap in her nervous breathing. She couldn't bring herself to look. Every bone in her body wanted to take off running through the forest, back out onto the interstate, to try and find some help. But there was nothing she could do. She could never outrun that thing. It was too fast, too savage. Even if she could convince someone on the highway to pull over and help her, they would just tell her she was going crazy. Maybe she was. Then the smell of her husband's body drifted over to her on the wind as the crunching sound of inhuman jaws filled the air. Panic set in. Then silence. She couldn't hear anything, not even a whisper in the trees. Had she done it? Had she survived? That's when a red sneaker stepped out from behind the tree, and Sally stared into the eyes of the blood-spattered hedgehog. Now, Sally had never been a gamer growing up. Sure, she played a little bit of Mario Kart and had a few Nintendogs back in the day, but the word gamer just wasn't for her. However, love conquers all, and when she found the man of her dream, she decided that it would be worth at least giving some of his hobbies a go. They started off nice and easy, playing a bit of Stardew Valley, Minecraft, and maybe some Overcooked here and there. But before long, the pair of them were sitting down every day after work, headsets on and controllers in hand, ready to dive into the latest adventure. Just recently, the couple had gotten into retro games, going back and playing classics like Battletoads and Streets of Rage. The challenge was addictive, so when her husband John came home with a copy of an unmarked NES game, Sally was intrigued, to say the least. John explained that he had found it listed on eBay under a very suspicious account. He had gone to pick up the game after work that day, expecting to be greeted by the smiling face of the seller. Instead, he found a blank gray cartridge and a very brief manual wrapped together with an elastic band on a street corner. The seller had listed it for virtually nothing, and based on the description, seemed very eager to get rid of the game for some reason. So eager that he must not have wanted to stick around to even hand it over. Sally, already bored with this backstory, snatched the manual up and read the title of the game, Professor Gould's Terrifying Horror Challenge. There was no artwork, no branding, no publisher, no stickers, nothing to differentiate this game from being just a blank cartridge. As far as Sally knew, it could have been a virus, some kind of malware game designed to brick their NES. But the words horror and challenge from the title sold her. She blew on the pins in the cartridge and slotted it into place in the NES. A black screen appeared with nothing on it but two options, single player or two player. Sally uncoiled a second controller and handed it to John with a grin. You ready? Sally hit two player and a new screen came up. Are the people holding the controllers the people who want to play the game? Yes or no? Sally hit yes. A shrill beep filled the room, high-pitched and grating on their ears. John immediately grabbed for the remote and turned the volume down on the TV, but the beep just kept going. The screen was a bright red, filling the room with an unnatural bloody light. John tried to hit the off button on the remote, but the TV stayed red, and the beeping sound continued, filling their tiny apartment. Getting up and rushing over to the TV, John tried to unplug it, but it was no use. The beeping noise and the red screen persisted. He looked back at his wife in confusion, but she was looking somewhere else entirely. There was a rat in the corner of the room with mottled fur, bloated flesh, and cracked teeth. It stared right into Sally's eyes, salivating. Without a moment's hesitation, she leaped up onto the couch and screamed. But instead of running away, the rat slowly crept forward, looking almost as if it was smiling. Then a second one appeared, crawling out from behind the couch, followed by a third in the doorway, and a fourth beneath the TV. Dozens of rats filled the room, swarming in from all directions, climbing over one another in a desperate attempt to get into the tiny apartment to get to Sally and John. Sally clambered onto the couch with her laptop and tried to kick away any of the rats clambering up onto the furniture, but it was no use. For every rat she kicked away, another one appeared, until soon they were climbing their way up John's jeans, their sharp little claws digging into his flesh. 
The rats tore at Sally's clothes, climbing over one another desperately, heading towards her mouth trying to burrow their way in. Hairy bodies filled her vision and the stench of disease made her gag. Seizing an opportunity, a rat tried to clamber through her open jaws. She felt its tiny paws scrabbling at her tongue. With tears filling her eyes, she took one fleeting look at the man she loved and noticed something behind him. A giant yellow bottle with the words rat poison stamped into the side was sitting precariously on top of their cabinet. Half stumbling, half swimming, Sally pushed her way through the throng of rats filling their apartment and desperately grabbed the bottle from on top of the cabinet. Throwing the rats off her hands, she managed to unscrew the lid, held the bottle high over her head, and poured the thick, stinking liquid all over the swarm of rats threatening to engulf her. The chorus of death filled the room. Whether it was the sound of the rats dying or their bodies being evaporated by the poison, she couldn't tell. All she could do was push through to try and find her husband and save him, too. And miraculously, within just a few seconds, all of the rats had disappeared. The room was empty, the same as it had always been. Even the big yellow bottle was gone from her hand. All she could do was stare at John as he stared back at her, as the words, Level 1, Complete, appeared above their heads. Welcome to SCP-1315, the most visceral, most real, and most dangerous horror game you will ever have the misfortune of playing. It's not too late to back out at the menu screen when you select how many players you want. It's not even too late at the confirmation screen, but once you're in the game, there's no turning back. Either you beat the game, or you die trying. Beating this game is no easy feat. A copy of SCP-1315 has been in Foundation containment since 1986, but in all of that time, only one D-Class personnel has managed to make it to level 33. It is not known how many levels there are, but there is, theoretically, a final boss. The reason why no one has been able to beat it thus far is that with each level, the difficulty of the game increases. Relatively minor challenges in the first few levels give way to extremely difficult, life-threatening scenarios as the player progresses. These levels broadly follow the same pattern each time, but individual levels often contain an element of randomness. For example, level 1 that Sally and John played contained rats, but other tests have shown subjects being swarmed by insects and spiders, often coinciding with established phobias that the subject has reported prior to the experiment. Two hours later, John and Sally were running low on ammo. With both couches pushed against the door to the lounge, they both hunkered down behind the TV, loading the remains of their shells into the shotguns. From out in the hallway, they could hear the heavy footsteps of more animals rushing towards them. When the pounding on their door had first started, they assumed it had been their neighbor coming up to complain about their screaming and running around in the previous levels. John had been so deep in thought trying to work out what their cover story could be, that when he opened the door and saw an adult grizzly bear standing on its hind legs in front of him, it had taken him almost too long to react. Sprinting back into the lounge, he found his wife already loading rounds into the shotgun that had suddenly appeared on the floor in front of her. With a grim expression on her face, she seemed to have accepted their new reality, that this was a game they were going to have to fight their way through. But with every bear they shot as it tried to push its way into their lounge, two more had appeared just minutes later. While they had been conservative with their ammo, aiming for the heads and not taking any risks, the pair was starting to run dangerously low. Was there an objective they were missing? Were they supposed to have done something to progress through the level? Sally mashed a couple buttons on the NES controller, and then some text appeared on the red screen. Objective. Survive. Four bears appeared in the doorway and pushed hard against the couch. It slid out of the way and they charged into the room. Sally and John desperately took down the first two of them, but the dreaded click of the triggers told them they had nothing left. Closing their eyes and bracing themselves for the worst, the pounding of heavy paws on their vinyl floor suddenly stopped. The bears had disappeared. Level 3. Complete. <sighs> well, whatever's next can't be worse than that, surely. But it was. They managed to hold out in their apartment until level 9. But then the windows behind their heads smashed into a thousand shards as a black-booted SWAT team swung into the room. With barely any time to react, 
Sally and John push their way out of the apartment and brace themselves down to their car. Slamming both doors closed, they took off racing towards the highway as the SWAT vehicles pursued them. Three hours later, the couple was running low on gas, swerving their way along the interstate, their eyes on the mirrors constantly. The pair was pretty certain they'd managed to lose their assailants. Slowing their car to the speed limit, they gently weaved their way through the traffic towards the nearest gas station. Trying their best not to look suspicious, the two of them went inside, keen to stock up on supplies. Who knew how long this game would go on for? They had already been active for hours and were exhausted. With the SWAT team hopefully long behind them now, the adrenaline rush was starting to wear off, and the reality of this situation was starting to set in. Hopefully, there were just ten levels and they only had one to go. With the sinking feeling in their chests, each one of them realized it was more than likely to be 100. Definitely time to stock up on some supplies. They were barely halfway around the gas station when the words, Level 9, Complete, flashed in the sky above them. Both John and Sally froze where they were and stared at each other over the aisles. A blue flash darted past them outside the windows, then again going the other way. Sally ran over to the counter and banged on the glass. Lock the door! Lock the door! But the teenager just looked at her in confusion. And now it was Sally's turn to look around and see her husband staring in horror. On the other side of the glass, standing between two gas pumps, was Sonic.exe. With haunting red eyes, rows and rows of sharp teeth, and blood dripping from his mouth, the hedgehog stared intently. Sally pointed out the window and turned to the teenager, yelling, but the girl took a step back, looking scared of her. The girl couldn't see it. She couldn't see Sonic. For all these challenges, all the things they'd been fighting, was it just in her head? But there was no time to worry about that. Sally ran towards the door to the back of the shop. Hearing the footsteps of her husband running after her, she kicked open the fire exit but froze immediately. Sonic.exe was standing there in front of her, smiling. It was toying with them. They needed to run to get out of here as quickly as possible, but how could they outrun Sonic? Hey, Sonic! John yelled from behind her. You hungry? He pushed Sally out of the way and threw a handful of chili dogs out into the forest. Hearing hungry, Sonic spun around and chased after his favorite food as quickly as possible. That had only bought them a few moments of time, but maybe that was all that they would get. Sally and John ran back through the convenience store and out the front. They couldn't run, but they could at least try to hide. A semi-truck had a slam on the brakes as the pair of them ran across the interstate. Without a choice of running anywhere else, all they could do was dart into the woods on the other side and hope that Sonic had a bad sense of smell. But as they ran through the woods, they could hear an ominous voice echoing behind them. Gotta go fast! Gotta go faster than that! Sally found a tree and dived into cover just at the right moment. Her husband wasn't so lucky. There was a flash of blue and a horrible crunching sound before his body hit the ground. Sonic.exe was on top of him in a heartbeat, rows of sharp teeth gnashing. Sally clasped both hands over her face, trying desperately to block out the smell and trap her nervous breathing. She couldn't bring herself to look. Every bone in her body wanted to take off running through the forest, out onto the road to try and find some help. But there was nothing she could do. She could never outrun that thing. It was too fast, too savage. Even if she could convince someone on the highway to pull over and help her, they would just tell her she was going crazy. Maybe she was. Then the smell of her husband's body drifted over to her on the wind, as the crunching sound of inhuman jaws filled her ears. New tears flowed. Then, silence. She couldn't hear anything, not even a whisper in the trees. Had she done it? Had she survived? Then a red sneaker stepped out from behind the tree, and Sally stared into the eyes of the blood-splattered, deranged hedgehog. Sally blinked, and it was gone. Level 10 complete. The open forest stretched out in front of her, Without a moment to catch her breath, Sally took off running into the country on her own. Whatever was coming next, she had to be ready for it. The shinobi crouched low on the pagoda roof and listened to the night air. Up here in the mountains, away from the hustle and bustle of the markets in town, it was almost silent. Just the distant rattle of shutters somewhere behind him. The mountain shrine was tucked out of sight. 
so far into the countryside that no one would stumble onto it by accident. No one would come here without a reason. The shinobi knew the face of his target, a warlord turned politician with more blood on his hands than the assassin sent to kill him. By the burning glow of the night sky, the shinobi could see the man kneeling at the shrine. The path was made up of small stones, so he'd have to drop onto the grass and creep around the pond to approach his target. No guards, no one else was there at all. This was the spot where the man came to pray when he was struggling to sleep, perhaps trying to atone for the lives he'd taken. Perhaps he didn't care at all. The ninja drew the blade in total silence and timed his drop to the ground with the rattling noise in the distance. With each dainty step, he closed the distance to his target, readying the blade over his head. It was done in a moment. The man was dead before his body hit the ground. He likely didn't even notice as the steel had severed the nerves running down his spinal cord. So shard was the blade that had slid through his bones like a fish through water. Raising the blade to his eyes, the shinobi cleaned it quickly. If he was seen with blood on his sword, he would immediately be implicated. Not that he was ever seen, but precautions like this were what kept him out of sight for all these years. When you lived in the Valley of Ashes, the burial grounds for countless wars, you had to become a shadow, become one of the ancient spirits haunting the woods. But as he wiped the red from the steel, he caught a flash of light in the reflection, an orange glow marking a jagged line across the metal. That's strange. Sunset was several hours ago. Come to think of it, why was there an orange glow in the sky? He snapped his neck around to see the fires through the gates into the pagoda's garden. Down by the ocean's edge at the foot of the mountains was the city where he had always lived, and it was on fire. Leaping up onto the walls, he stood up straight, surveying the horror scene taking place before him. Thick plumes of smoke billowed up into the night sky, so dense and large that it seemed to become the blackness of the night. It was hard to make out much of what was going on down there. The shinobi looked everywhere to try to see the invading army or the rioters, but there were none. Just people running in all directions, like ants out of a flooding nest. But there, moving in amongst the smoke, were other shapes, impossibly tall, lumbering around like people. People that towered over the houses, that had to crane down to the ground to scoop up the poor civilians who were running this way and that. The shinobi stood there terrified, as he realized that the rattling sound he'd been hearing all night wasn't from any shutters at all. He could do nothing but watch as the trees in front of him trembled and buckled in all directions as a hulking shadowy figure lumbered towards him. The Imperial Japanese Anomalous Matters Examination Agency, or the IJAMEA, was a Japanese agency responsible for tracking a number of mysterious and often dangerous artifacts, creatures, and anomalies prior to the Second World War. In 1945, the IJAMEA was shut down and absorbed into the SCP Foundation. All of these data, historic records, and anomalies were all transferred over into the Foundation's control. Reasons for this were partially political and partially in the interest of world peace. The formation of the IJMEA was influenced heavily by Japan's ties with Germany in the first half of the 20th century. The Imperial German Anomalous Matters Examination Agency was the blueprint for their Japanese equivalent. However, with increasing militarism in Japan throughout the 20th century, the IJMEA became increasingly obsessed with trying to harness their anomalous discoveries in the interests of military power. Their goal became the establishment of a yokai battalion, powerful enough to establish them as one of, if not the world's greatest superpower. Following the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan surrendered in the Second World War and agreed to dissolve its military, including the IJAMEA. That left the Foundation with the task of picking up the threads left behind and trying to come up with new ways of securing, containing, and protecting some of Japan's most deadly SCPs. Few more deadly and evasive than the entities that were too much, even for the Yokai Battalion. SCP-2863 In 1946, cleanup operations were in full effect, trying to deal with the fallout from the atomic bomb dropped on Nagasaki. Crews dressed in lead-lined suits worked around the clock, burying radioactive material and trying to remove as much contaminated debris as possible. 
rebuilding the city was still a long way off. At various points, the wind would kick up and carry the dust left behind into the air, creating a dangerous radioactive haze. Crews continued to work through such conditions as the understanding of airborne contamination was still in its infancy. Watanabe Goro was one such worker. Midway through a night shift and clasping a damp rag to his mouth, he pushed on through the dust, clearing out building after building. They had spent the morning carrying corpses out of an unidentifiable building. The corpses themselves were pretty much worn away too, just skeletons really, charred by the blast from months before. As Goro staggered along the street, he kept feeling like he was imagining things. The long hours and traumatic conditions were enough to make him see all kinds of things in his dreams, but he kept feeling like his dreams were starting to creep into the real world. Shadows kept moving through the haze all around him, taller than buildings, staggering around as if they were drunk. They had been appearing all night, just out of sight, but always close by. He stopped and leaned against what was left of a brick wall. There was one of his hallucinations now, just up ahead of him. The husks of buildings on either side of him were about as tall as their knees. It must have been 30 meters tall, at least. But its legs were strange. There seemed to be a gap in the middle of each of them. They were skinny. No, skeletal. The skeleton's foot crushed a car right in front of him. The crunch of metal was loud enough to snap Goro out of his stupor. This wasn't a hallucination. Hallucinations can't crush cars. With a yelp, he tumbled backwards, staring up into the haze of dust. He saw the shape of a pelvis. Above it, what must have been a ribcage the size of his house, but the creature disappeared into the darkness and the dust. If it was too tall for him to see its face, maybe it was too tall to see him on the ground as well. The skeleton stopped, standing directly over him. For a second, he thought that maybe he'd be okay. But then, with a great rattling rumble, the monster hunched down low, and the enormous skull appeared out of the haze, flying right towards him. He managed to dodge its gnashing teeth, but it caught his foot, sending him rolling through the radioactive dirt. Goro didn't give himself a moment to recover, though. He took off running as fast as he could, hearing the rattling sound terrifyingly close behind his back. You will be pleased to know that Watanabe Goro survived this incident. With only minor injuries, he managed to navigate his way to the nearest police station, where SCP agents, already familiar with the entity he had encountered, took control of the situation. The so-called starving skeletons had been roaming the bomb sites for several weeks by that point. It was the Foundation's first exposure to one of the oldest known entities that the IJAMEA had been studying for years. To date, 206 separate instances of SCP-2863 have been officially recorded. However, the myth of the Gasha Dokoru had been circulating in various parts of Japan since the 10th century at least. Giant skeletons were said to haunt the sites of particularly deadly battles, hunting by night and feeding on the blood of their human victims. These myths tally up with what the Foundation currently knows about these entities. Instances of SCP-2863 only appear after sunset and will lose all corporeality when exposed to sunlight in the morning, or any light source over 1.1 lux. To give you some reference for that, moonlight typically falls between 0.25 and 1 lux. A typical room with the light on will be 100 or even 1,000 times brighter. As you can imagine, this has made them virtually impossible to contain as they manifest and unmanifest outside of controllable conditions. They seem to have continuous existence in some way, however, as previously neutralized instances can and will reappear later on. In folklore, the Gasha Dokoro are spirits that take control of skeletons. Some hesitant researchers have posited that perhaps the instances that dematerialize are returning to their spirit form. Little is understood about what that means in practice. What's more, this SCP cannot be photographed. All attempts to capture them on film or digital cameras have failed, including video tests. It is theorized that there is a link between them not appearing on camera and their disappearance when exposed to light. Again, the link between them is still mostly unknown. Due to a steady increase in urban development in Japan and ongoing peace in the region, appearances of this SCP are growing increasingly rare. While this marks a positive change for the people of Japan, it makes it even more difficult to study this SCP and learn how to prevent it in the future. 
The most recent fatality to occur at the bony hands of SCP-2863 happened in 2008, and it was part of a Foundation experiment. While most of Hiroshima and Nagasaki had been redeveloped into bustling metropolitan areas, the outskirts of each city, particularly several parks, saw occasional instances of SCP-2863 appearing at night. As such, the SCP Foundation conducted a series of experiments under cover of nightfall, releasing D-Class personnel into a park in Hiroshima to observe how the SCPs hunted humans. Their enormous height, towering at over 30 meters, gave them a huge advantage, being able to chase people down with little difficulty. Another notable thing about them is just how quietly they move. There is a gentle rattling sound that follows them around, but aside from that, they are very light-footed and difficult to detect until they are right on top of you. This isn't helped by the fact that they hunt at night. As a result, they are remarkably quick at catching their prey. Once they have snatched their victims up in their skeletal fingers, they perform the same eating ritual every time. They eat the person and consume their blood. Initially confused by this finding, the Foundation was unsure where the blood was going, as the skeletons had no obvious digestive system. After the release of several more D-Class personnel into the park, they still weren't certain, but they believed that the SCP instances were absorbing the blood into their bones in some way. Further testing was requested, but denied due to the sheer number of D-Class fatalities in the area. They were starting to run out, and would have to ship more of them across to Japan, which was just a bit inconvenient for everyone involved. As the outskirts of those cities have been urbanized, the instances of SCP-2863 have reduced to the point that a smaller contingent of agents and researchers are now left in place. The light pollution from these areas is enough to prevent them from being able to manifest in the first place for the most part. Only on the rare occasion of power outages have Mobile Task Force 03 been deployed. Whilst researching this SCP, the Foundation came across an account from a shinobi in the 1700s. It was rare to find any kind of written document from a ninja for obvious reasons, but the account discovered painted a harrowing picture of just how much damage these yokai could inflict upon a city. The nameless shinobi first encountered SCP-2863 while assassinating an unnamed target in the mountains above his fishing town. Looking down on the fires below him, he saw human shapes walking through the smoke, dwarfing the buildings they moved between, before an instance charged through the trees straight at him. Diving out of the way, the shinobi quickly melted into the shadows. Both man and demon hunted one another throughout the night. He managed to climb onto its spine and inflict what he was certain would be a killing blow to the skeleton, only for his blade to bounce right off the bone. Caught and vulnerable for the first time in his life, the shinobi was helpless as the spirit threw him from its back into the courtyard and charged at him. It was only the hem of the ninja's sleeve catching fire from a candle that saved him. Just as the skeleton was about to bite down on his head, the light flared and the SCP disappeared entirely. For a long while, the man lay in the courtyard, pondering his actions. He should have died that night, yet he survived. Getting slowly to his feet, the man now knew what his destiny was. A monster that strikes from the shadows, scared of the light. He and the Gasha Dokoru were not so different. Understanding his target was the first step to defeating them. Snatching up a lantern from the ground, the shinobi descended the mountain into the wreckage of his hometown and defended his people. By night, he would emerge hunting down the Gashadokuru under the cover of darkness, banishing them with the light hidden under a dark sheet. The man fought night after night, narrowly risking death to save his people from the onslaught of the evil spirit. A small plaque was installed by the IJAMEA shortly before the Foundation took over the management of the SCP. It was installed at the foot of an old pagoda just outside a small fishing village. On it was a simple haiku. Walking in shadow, in the midst of our demons, we will find the light. A veteran worker of the SCP Foundation sits at his terminal, performing one of the most critical tasks in the entire organization, creating a file for an as yet undescribed SCP. But there's something terribly wrong. His eyes are glazed over. His mouth hangs open. Is this a zombie or a trained Foundation researcher? What is going on? Like any large international organization, it takes more than just the exciting, action-filled jobs to keep the wheels turning at the SCP Foundation. Sure, the head researchers, guards, mobile task force soldiers, and members of the O5 Command get all the praise, 
but a legion of number crunchers, cleaners, and paper pushers are equally important. One such person was archivist Walter Bainbridge, who had been tasked with digitizing some of the older records that the Foundation had on file. It was when he was innocently recording the details on SCP-050 through 060 that he first came under the strange and startling effects of SCP-055. But the most peculiar part, as with all incidents of SCP-055's anomalous effects taking hold, is that Walter had no idea any of it was happening. In his new digitized filing system, he first took note of SCP-053, Euclid class, also known as the young girl. This anomaly was a seemingly normal human female child who provoked homicidal insanity in those directly exposed to her. Then SCP-054, safe class, a non-aggressive humanoid female made entirely of, as well as biologically and chemically identical to regular spring water. Next, SCP-056, Euclid class, a being that changes form to suit its environment, but only when all observers lose focus of it. And then, SCP-057, safe class, an underground chamber that crushes the humans who walk within. It was at this point that Walter received a concerned message from one of his superiors at Site-19, Mr. Kovach. The message praised the thorough digitization of the other anomalies' records, but was confused about why Walter had left out any mention of SCP-055. Immediately, Walter was embarrassed. How could he have forgotten SCP-055, that iconic anomaly known for… well, he couldn't quite say off the top of his head, but he'd be sure to look into it. A quick trip to the Site-19 archive showed him that there was actually quite a hefty file on the nature of SCP-055, which must have been the result of a huge number of studies. What struck him as strange was that all the files were filled out in pen rather than being typed up like a traditional file. The majority of these notes were written in shorthand, too, as though they were frantically taken during the tests themselves on extremely short notice. There weren't even any redactions. Walter made a mental note of what he had seen, put the file back in its proper place, and headed back to his computer terminal. However, after writing in an almost trance-like state, he looked back on his work to see that he had written an entry on SCP-058, a giant evil bovine heart with insect legs and a scorpion stinger. Strange, he thought. That's when Walter got a call from Mr. Kovach on his Foundation issue phone, and he didn't sound happy. He'd given Walter direct instructions to go back and digitize the files on 055, and instead he'd been working on 058. What was the meaning of this? Walter was typically an extremely loyal and diligent employee, but the verbal barrage from his supervisor had him considering talking back, just this once, and hoping it didn't get him demoted to D-Class and thrown into 682's acid bath for playtime. Walter gulped picked up some courage, and interrupted Mr. Kovach's rant to ask if he had any idea what SCP-055 actually was. The line went silent for a moment, then his supervisor spoke again, this time with less confidence. Uh, of course I can tell you about SCP-055. Uh, it's a classic, one of the first hundred. How could you forget it's, uh, or, yeah, you know, it's, I think it's the one with, um, Another long pause as Mr. Kovach seemed to search for the words, but instead just trailed off into silence. Knowing that some of the anomalies on file were dangerous mimetic hazards, Walter was worried for a moment that he may have accidentally killed his boss by getting him to think too hard about SCP-055. He asked if Mr. Kovach was okay, and finally got a reply. I'm sorry, I seem to have zoned out for a second there. What were we talking about again? But this time it was Walter who couldn't answer. He had no idea at all what the two of them were discussing just moments ago. He felt disoriented and kind of sick, like they'd taken some low-level amnestics. Mr. Kovach told Walter to get back to his filing duties and they'd speak later. Walter then checked the messages he'd received from Mr. Kovach earlier, and there it was, plain as day. You missed 055. Go back and digitize that before proceeding, Mr. K. But Walter had never even heard of an SCP-055 if such an anomaly even existed. What was going on here? In that moment, Walter realized he was dealing with something much stranger than just a standard digitization job. After all, 
How could he properly complete his duties if SCP-055 seemed to be impossible to speak, write, or even think about, unless you were directly observing it at that moment? Walter had to know, and ask around the entirety of Site-19 to find the answers if he had to. Sadly for Walter, he was about to embark on a much more challenging task than he could have ever imagined. To paraphrase a supposed quote from Socrates, All I know is that I know nothing. And that's also about the extent of the knowledge we have on SCP-055, also known as the anti-meme and the self-keeping secret. What does it look like? When and how was it obtained by the Foundation? What are its anomalous abilities? Is this thing dangerous? We may never know. Because the only anomalous ability of SCP-055 that we're aware of is the fact that nobody is capable of retaining any information about it. It's crucial to note that whatever 055 is, it isn't invisible or indescribable. Foundation personnel are perfectly capable of entering its containment chamber and observing it without incident. But mere minutes after leaving the chamber, any memories of the particulars of 055 seem to spontaneously erase themselves. Hence, the self-keeping secret. But this didn't deter Walter. Perhaps his greatest advantage was that he didn't know enough about the thing he was investigating to know how futile his mission was. He wanted to know the unknowable. And a pesky issue like impossibility wouldn't stop him. He'd get to whoever he needed to at Site-19 to get the answers he needed. Of course, most people had no knowledge of the mysterious anomaly. The common response he got back from his colleagues was, 055? Do we even have a 055? While the realization of sudden memory loss, or the realization of 055's existence, has been known to cause momentary stress, there are no known long-term physical or mental effects from 055's anomalous abilities. It's a fleeting idea in its purest form, like forgetting why you walked into a room. 055 could be the most harmless object on the Foundation's roster, or the most deadly. Either way, we just don't know. At times, Walter worried he was going insane. 055 and everything related to it was gaslighting him. Was 055 even real? The one thing that proved to him that 055 must have existed is that its containment chamber existed. According to the official records kept by the Foundation on the Site-19 containment facilities, 055 is kept in a 5x5 five by, five by 2.5 meter square room constructed of 50-foot thick cement, with a Faraday cage surrounding the cement walls. The report continues that, Access is via a heavy containment door measuring 2 by 2.5 meters, constructed on bearings to ensure door closes and locks automatically unless held open deliberately. 055 cell is one of the few to have no posted security guards, and any personnel working on other SCPs in the area are ordered to remain at least 50 feet from the geometric center of 055 cell, where the anomaly itself is kept. When he tried to explore further why the cell was constructed in this manner, he found that, surprise, surprise, nobody knew. 055 was an anomaly whose containment requirements were so mysterious that it automatically netted itself a Keter-class designation. After all, how can you properly contain something you can't even hope to comprehend? There were plenty of rumors about the true nature of 055. Some of the more conspiratorial minds at Site-19 theorized that 055 was actually an autonomous or remotely controlled spy inserted into the site to observe Foundation operations, or even humanity as a whole. If you're on the more paranoid end of the psychological spectrum, this theory makes total sense. An anomaly that's physically impossible to remember, even when writings and pictures on the subject exist, would be a perfect spy. However, this was all ultimately little more than speculation. Walter was barely any further along than when he started. There were multiple points in his investigations where Walter seriously considered giving up. Until finally, he had a major breakthrough. Dr. Bartholomew Hughes and Dr. John Marichek were two scientists that had performed extensive research into 055, and who, Walter hoped, might have the answers he sought about the self-keeping secret. These scientists were the first to discover the anti-memetic nature of 055, performing numerous tests on D-Class personnel to see if it was possible to create feasible written records 
sketches, or any other records or impressions that could bypass its anomalous effects. The disorienting, memory-ruining effects of 055 also extend to any materials concerning 055. It seems to be a truly uncrackable code, but Dr. Hughes may have finally found some cracks in the armor. For starters, the fact that we're able to remember that 055 is an anti-memetic is an ironic exception to its anti-memetic qualities. This revelation also inspired another realization from Dr. Hughes. Would it be possible to discover more about 055 from the process of deduction rather than the typical induction? In other words, could they possibly learn about 055 by figuring out all the things it isn't rather than what it is? Dr. Marichek designed an experiment with Dr. Hughes to explore this theory. They designed the experiment around a simple question. Is 055 not spherical? In designing the question to specifically find out what 055 isn't, they hoped to subvert the anomaly's anti-memetic powers. Walter was fascinated by this potential method of getting answers. Marichek and Hughes found that, while the questioning process for those exposed was often arduous and frustrating, they could now definitely say that 055 is not a sphere. It is theoretically possible to discover the true nature of 055 by an almost endless barrage of deductive questions, though whether command would authorize the resources for such extensive testing is still an open question. Walter, in his desperation, begged Marichek and Hughes for clearance to view 055 himself. The curiosity had become too great during a search to just walk away with the single fact that 055 wasn't spherical. He needed to see this thing. And after several weeks of filling out forms and cutting red tape, his wish was finally granted. Walter Bainbridge was allowed a private audience with SCP-055, the subject of his months-long obsession. Outsiders observed that Walter spent just over an hour in the containment chamber, taking photos, drawing sketches, writing down notes, recording audio logs, and reciting memory mnemonics. He was pulling out every stop to counteract the anti-memetic effects of the self-keeping secret. He was adamant that he would not be defeated by his non-spherical nemesis, not after all this time and effort. Once his time in the 055 containment chamber was over, he retired back to his office to finally digitize his exhaustive findings, so that his supervisor Mr. Kovach would finally get off his back. Walter smiled, took a deep breath, and began to type. SCP-059, Keter class. This anomaly is a radioactive mineral that emits a unique radiation known as delta radiation. Exposure to this radiation has caused strange fungal growths on the infected... Wait, what was this supposed to be about again? Oh well, it couldn't have been that important. Researcher Martin pushed the deck against the door, hoping it would hold long enough for him to find an alternate escape route. He wasn't thinking about the long term. He couldn't afford to. With the Foundation's global reach, he'd never truly escape them, never be able to make it away, condemned to spend the rest of his life on the run from the organization he'd devoted his life to. It was too overwhelming to even attempt to reckon with that, especially with the pounding of a fist against the door. He scrabbled around, opening windows to try and see if there was a safe way down. Technically, none of this was his fault, at least in his mind. The administrative login information he'd used to access the file shouldn't have been left so easy to find. That was just poor cybersecurity on the Foundation's part. Researcher Martin had been tasked with compiling information on SCP-001, one of the most infamous anomalies ever encountered in the Foundation's long and storied history, or multiple of them at least. What Martin had come to learn was there were numerous entities within the Foundation's files that all acted as proposals for SCP-001. Some were creatures, the typical kind of anomalous entities the Foundation dealt with on a regular basis, but some of the proposals focused on more abstract anomalies, and somehow, those were more existentially terrifying than any evil godlike being bent on destroying reality. Theories about the very source of anomalies themselves, that their very existence might have been predetermined by some otherworldly force. Then there were the other proposals that named parts of the Foundation as the true SCP-001. Those seemed to suck Researcher Martin in like a vortex, 
dragging him down a deep, dark rabbit hole that made him start to question everything he thought he knew about working for the SCP Foundation, and the one that had toppled him into a full-blown conspiracy-obsessed stupor that there was no coming back from, the Noir Box Proposal. The weighted head of a battering ram splintered the wooden surface of the door, spraying fragments over the room. The table propped up to keep it shut toppled under the force of the entry as a squad of shadowy figures in full black combat gear rushed inside. The mobile task force surrounded the cowering researcher, keeping their weapons trained on him. Researcher Martin, pleading for his life, started gesturing to the walls of the room around him that had been plastered with hastily scrawled diagrams and equations. Martin tried desperately to find some concise, easy-to-understand way of explaining to the soldiers what he'd uncovered. They only picked up on a few words like many worlds hypothesis and splitting universes, but ultimately they didn't follow what he was saying and weren't sent there to hear him out. All the MTF had been told was that Researcher Martin had breached Foundation security and now posed a risk of exposing sensitive information about SCP-001. There was only one path of recourse, termination. However, unbeknownst to them, Dr. Martin was fine, at least a version of him was, one who never learned about the Noir Box proposal for SCP-001 and hadn't gone mad trying to unravel its mysteries. Instead, he was a respected, higher-ranking member of the Foundation who was alive and well, in a completely different timeline. The formation of the SCP Foundation has always been shrouded in mystery, with nobody really knowing what the true origin of the organization is and what is merely just a cover story left in the archives to keep the truth hidden. SCP-001, the Noir Box proposal at least, might hold the answers to the questions surrounding how the Foundation came to be three times over. Known as the Tindalos Trinity, the file pertaining to this anomaly is buried deep in the SCP Foundation's database, under layers upon layers of encryption and security clearance requirements. It requires someone at the very top level of the Foundation to access, a member of either the Overseer Council or the Foundation's High Command, or Overwatch. But wait, what are those? Aren't they the same thing? Well, yes and no. The exact name of the high-ranking secretive group that runs the Foundation has often been interchangeable, whether they're known as the O5 Council, the Overseer Council, etc. But what if it wasn't just many different names for the same governing body, but actually separate names for alternate versions of the ones who control the SCP Foundation? Allow us to explain. All three of these groups, the Overseer Council, High Command, and Overwatch, have come to a consensus that SCP-001 is an anomaly that connects with the Foundation's very origin. They believe that the founder of the SCP Foundation, also known as SCP-001, was anomalous in some way that caused them to interact with time in an unusual fashion. The Triumvirate of Councils are in agreement that around the time that the SCP Foundation was formed, three distinct timelines were generated, given the anomalous nature of the organization's founder. Each of these timelines drastically altered the nature of SCP-001, featuring a different version in each one. In the first, commonly known as Timeline HC, where the Foundation is run by a high command, SCP-001 was an anomalous human corpse. This timeline's SCP-001 still exhibited all the behavioral characteristics of a normal human being, but could additionally replicate itself at an erratic, uncontrollable rate, usually when performing tasks that could have multiple possible outcomes. SCP-001 in Timeline HC also interacted anachronistically with its environment, passing through solid matter that predated it or would outlast it. So, it had to be contained in a room that was constructed before it existed as an anomaly. This timeline's SCP-001 was responsible for conceiving the idea for the SCP Foundation and was able to promote a significant interest in the organization. However, they were assassinated before the Foundation was officially codified, with the culprits being a version of Mobile Task Force ALP-0, who are believed to have originated from either of the other two timelines. While this seems to have been done to deter the Foundation forming in this timeline, it seems to have had the opposite effect. Despite the assassination of SCP-001, occurring before the official formation of the SCP Foundation in Timeline HC, this version of the Foundation was successfully codified by the 13 members of what they referred to as High Command. 
Given the anomalous circumstances around the death of SCP-001, it provided the catalyst for the organization to immediately establish itself as this timeline's protection against the threat posed by anomalous entities. The body of SCP-001 was placed in the building that had been its childhood home, securing it somewhere that predated them to negate their anomalous properties. This made them the first anomaly contained by Timeline HC's version of the SCP Foundation, posthumously garnering them the official designation of SCP-001. So, that's the first of our three timelines at play. The events that unfold in the second are considerably different. In this timeline, Timeline OC, the Foundation was initially created by a different SCP-001. This entity, referred to primarily as the Founder, appropriately enough, was a human being known to possess anomalous temporal abilities. The Founder was known to also be immortal, showing no visible signs of aging, and with a resistance to external damage that prevented him from being directly killed. Any injuries he sustained could be healed, but only at the same rate typical of an average human being. The temporal side of his anomalous properties pertained to predicting the future. The Founder was able to, with an inarguable level of precision and accuracy, forecast events before they occurred. His foresight, it appeared to the Foundation, was not inciting these events to happen as he predicted them. However, everything he ever predicted would occur became an inevitability, impossible to delay, avert, or alter through any means. During the events of Timeline OC, and as his preferred nickname implies, the Founder was the sole figure responsible for establishing this version of the SCP Foundation. In this course of events, the O5 Council of this timeline were known as the Overseer Council. It was, however, while he was in the process of establishing the organization that things started to go awry. Whether he was able to predict this occurrence or not is unknown, although it seems to have corresponded with the MTF Alp Zero assassination of SCP-001 in the other timeline, Timeline HC. In Timeline OC, at the same time as the assassination in Timeline HC, the Founder began to exhibit his anomalous temporal properties in front of the original members of Overseer Council. However, it should also be noted that there was no recorded presence of MTF Alp Zero in Timeline OC. Believing the Founder to be a potential danger to the Foundation they had all helped to create, the Founding Overseer Council classified him as an anomalous threat. They immediately devised a set of containment measures for the Founder, now designating him as SCP-001, the first anomaly contained by this timeline's version of the Foundation. He was placed within a standard humanoid containment cell and given regular meals, while personnel were forbidden to communicate with him. Given his role in establishing the Foundation in this version of events, SCP-001 is, naturally, in favor of containing and analyzing anomalies. However, not when that includes him, and insisted that he be released. According to one of his predictions for forthcoming events, he requested to be allowed to build a device, but refused to elaborate on the intended purpose of it. SCP-001 even refused to allow other members of Foundation personnel to construct the device on his behalf for testing purposes. The third of these timelines is referred to as Timeline OW, wherein the leading body of the Foundation are known as Overwatch. Here, just like the previous iterations of its history, the description of SCP-001 and their role in forming the SCP Foundation differs. In this timeline, SCP-001 is an anomaly that consists of two distinct parts. The first of these is a figure not dissimilar from the Founder. Referred to as SCP-001-1, this person is also a functionally immortal human, who doesn't age and can't heal rapidly from damage. SCP-001-1 also advocates for securing and analyzing anomalies. However, this includes himself, as he doesn't object to his own containment, or that of the second component of this SCP-001. Known as SCP-001-A, this device is capable of accurately calculating any and all possible outcomes of any event that is input into it. Unlike the Founder, who seemed to possess a foresight able to predict the only inevitable outcome of the future, SCP-001-A is able to account for the possibility of multiple potential futures, even down to accounting for how its own predictions could potentially influence or alter outcomes. In layman's terms, at least one of the eventualities predicted by SCP-001-A will always be accurate. 
unless the predictions are to do with its own future, or the future of SCP-001-1. In this instance, the device will always produce one of two assumptions that are incorrect. Either that SCP-001-1 was killed after an assassination attempt and never constructed SCP-001-A, but that's impossible after all. SCP-001-A exists, it's already been made in this timeline. The other incorrect prediction it can give is that SCP-001-1 also exhibits the same anomalous properties as the prediction machine, more akin to the founder, and that SCP-001-A was never constructed in the first place. But again, that can't be right, in this timeline anyway. According to records within Timeline OW, their version of the Founder, who is, of course, a CP-001-1, encountered a version of Mobile Task Force ALP-0 from one of the other timelines. They presented the Founder of the OW timeline with detailed blueprints for the construction of SCP-001-A. The device's completion coincided with the assassination in Timeline HC and the corresponding anomalous incident in Timeline OC. After this point, MTF ALP-0 departs from Timeline OW. This version of the SCP Foundation is then created to study the device, SCP-001-A, with this founder and a group of his close friends, who would become this Foundation's Overwatch. Following this initial research group's discovery of other anomalous phenomenon that threatened the rest of society, the team's goal expanded to research anomalies and protect the world from the danger they posed. However, the rest of the Overwatch began to age at a natural rate. While the Founder didn't recognize this, he volunteered to be contained and studied, thus becoming a component of this timeline's SCP-001. Stepping back and looking at all these timelines, there seems to be a number of marked similarities, particularly relating to how the Foundation was established and how a figure, usually the one who founded the organization, possessed anomalous means of interacting with time and temporality. Under normal circumstances, interaction between alternate timelines should be impossible. But the preservation of information about all three on the SCP Foundation's database has somehow enabled all three timelines to communicate with each other. Through exchanging intelligence via their own versions of the database, all three iterations of the Foundation across the three timelines have learned that almost all of the anomalies they have encountered since being established are exclusive to their own timeline. There are a total of 17 anomalies that have been confirmed to exist across the three timelines. But there is a concerning factor in all this. The presence of an anachronistic military group referring to itself as MTF Alp Zero. This mobile task force's direct involvement in the events of both Timeline HC, where they assassinated SCP-001, and Timeline OW, where they provided schematics for SCP-001-A, raises an awful lot of questions. This MTF had to be acting on orders of the Foundation, but which version in which timeline? The consensus among the leading committees of all three, the High Command, Overseer Council, and Overwatch, is that at some unknown date in the future, each of them will inevitably send their own version of MTF Alp Zero back in time to alter the Foundation's past. And in a sense, they've already done it and seen how this altered the circumstances in order to inadvertently create the Foundation. But this poses the risk of one of these timelines overriding another, thus meaning all information garnered by alternate iterations of the Foundation could be lost. So, putting their heads together, these Foundation leading committees come to the conclusion that they need to attempt to merge all three timelines. And it seems the way to do so is using the device that Timeline OC's founder wanted to build, and that Timeline OW's founder was able to construct. This device is how this proposal for SCP-001 was given its nickname, the Noir Box. The intention of the Noir Box is to shunt all three timelines into a stable joint path, like turning loose strands into a single length of twine. As such, the leading committees of all three different timelines have agreed to share their intel on how each of them can safely create their own Noir Boxes, and all three will be used to merge the timelines. Every member of High Command, the Overseer Council, and Overwatch sign off on it. But whether or not the plan works is another matter. The fabric of time is delicate, and one wrong move could tear everything apart. Now check out SCP-001 Noir Box Proposal Hated Caesar and SCP-001 Overlord Censure for more.